So welcome. This is the letting go workshop. And I want to begin with asking you all, what is letting go to you? If I just say let go, somebody told you to let go, what do you think when you hear the term letting go? You can chat it, you can just shout it out, whatever. There's no wrong answer here. Absolutely no wrong answer. We got a message, surrender to ignore. Yes. Anything else? Some people say uh, to maybe cut out toxic people. I've heard that in seminars. <laughs> Acceptance. Uh, some people say uh, let go of my will, surrender it to a higher will. I hear that a lot. Be involved, but detached. Yes, mm -hmm. let go of resentments, let go of fear, let go of false beliefs. Thanks, Elizabeth. Very good. Very good. So I agree with all of that. And that's generally what letting go is. But if I've done my job by the end of this workshop, this short workshop, letting go, give it to God. Yes, I agree with that as well. I want you, when you hear the phrase letting go, when you hear the phrase surrender, when you hear the phrase release, I want you to think of emotions. We're going to hone in on feelings and emotions. That's what this workshop is going to really focus on. Before we really get into that, I'll tell you a little bit about me, just so uh, I know I, I'm a complete stranger. <laughs> um, my name's Dylan, Dylan Freed. Uh, I have a BA in psychology. I own some companies. I love to write articles and I've written a few books, and I've made several psychology programs, including on letting go. At the end, I'll give you my email. And if you email me, I'll give you a uh, free letting go program so you can review this. Uh, I also am completing a cognitive, uh, cognitive neuroscience master's degree where I'm studying consciousness, the sense of self and emotion. I'll eventually go on to my PhD. Uh, in my experiment uh, that I'm doing for my final thesis research, it's on emotion and the sense of self and consciousness. It's not exactly what we're related, uh, what we're doing here, but I think it's interesting to talk about because it somewhat relates. Essentially, what I do in my research, a, a few years ago, there was this experiment that made a lot of noise in neuroscience. You might have seen it as like a parlor trick on Instagram. Anyways, you take a rubber hand and you put a rubber hand down and then you put a curtain up and you put your real arm behind the curtain, okay? So if you look down at a table, you're looking at a rubber hand, your real arm's hidden just behind a curtain right here. And if an experimenter takes a brush and begins to brush your real arm at the same time they brush the rubber arm, over time, right, 60 seconds or so, and you're watching, it's key that you watch the rubber arm being brushed. If I stop brushing your real arm and I keep brushing your rubber arm, you feel as if your arm's being brushed. Your brain incorporates this fake rubber arm. I mean, it's obviously a fake rubber arm. It incorporates it into itself. It feels like that's part of it. So then if I take a hammer and I act like I'm going to hit the rubber hand, you jerk away. And then you're surprised because your real arm moves and the rubber hand's still there. So 50 times a second, your brain is updating its sense of self via the body image. And you can sneak into the brain different things like the rubber hand and it incorporates it into itself. You can even use uh, things that are kind of humanoid shaped that aren't even, they don't even look like a real human hand. It can be like a robotic hand and the brain can still make this part of itself. Now, of course, this experiment excited a lot of research and people took it into virtual reality. So you can have a virtual arm, you have the headset on, you can look at your virtual arm and you stroke your real arm and your virtual arm and the virtual arm starts to feel like your own. Now, in my research, um, we built on people who expanded on this. You know, we're just doing an arm or you do a leg. What if you could do your whole body? What if you felt like your whole body was a virtual body? So essentially what you do is you put somebody in a virtual reality environment. They have their virtual body. So when you move your real arm, your virtual arms move, you turn your head, your head moves, and you're looking in a mirror. So you're getting that visual feedback and maybe you're throwing balls that vibrate. So you're getting the tactile thing. And if you do this for a while, people start to feel as if the avatar, this digital body is their own body. And there's a variety of ways to test this. 
So what we do uh, in my research is we put people in this virtual environment. We get them connected to this virtual body. And when they're connected to this virtual body, we show them vicarious pain photos. A vicarious pain photo would be, if you've ever seen on YouTube, the fail army things where people like crash their bike and you go, you know, you kind of jump back. We also have video, we have images and videos. The images might be somebody's cutting vegetables, but the knife is over their finger and we put fake blood, right? So we take a picture with a knife and fake blood and you react to this. So we do this in the in-body state. So your first person perspective is inside this virtual body. And I should note, we also scan your head in. So it's your face, it's your head in uh, the virtual environment. And by the way, I just shaved my head for the first time and uh, since I was in high school. So this looks really weird to me to see myself <laughs> with no hair. Um, but so we do this while you're in the virtual body, you're seeing your real face while you do this. And we measure, we're gonna, we ask you uh, afterwards your reaction to it. So your conscious experience of these vicarious pain photos, but we also have galvanic skin response and some other measures that are measure, measuring kind of the unconscious, so the unconscious reaction to the stimuli. Then we do something tricky. We take the camera in VR, because essentially when you're looking at yourself in VR, you're looking out through this camera in the virtual environment. We take the camera, we move it behind you into the left to mimic an out-of-body experience. So we give a virtual out-of-body experience, and then we present the stimuli again. The hypothesis for negative stimuli, when you're slightly outside of your body, the impact of the emotion is going to be diminished a little bit. And there's a lot of reasons we think this. One reason is that people have depersonalization disorder. They have a feeling of being slightly outside their body, not connected to their body, and they have a flat affect and emotional stimuli doesn't excite them as much. We can get into why, but uh, we thought uh, if, if we could mimic sort of being outside the body, doing it voluntarily, it doesn't have the negative valence of depersonalization, we could maybe diminish uh, negative feelings. And we also hypothesize that would happen because mystics, you know, or meditators, when they feel like they're outside of the body, uh, they also have a, de a decrease in reaction to negative emotion. We counterintuitively maybe hypothesize that when you're experiencing positive emotion, like if you're there's these videos that have been proven to elicit awe in people, like these uh, th these videos of flying through space in VR typically elicit awe. We think when you're outside of the body experiencing awe, that's actually going to be intensified. It's going to move people closer to a state of ecstasy. Ecstasy, the etymology of that is to go to transcend the body, to be outside the body. So for negative emotions, we think it'll diminish. For positive emotions, we think it'll be enhanced. So that's what I'm doing in my research. And I'll touch upon how it relates, especially with unconscious emotion as we go on. Um, so the case I'm going to make today is that typical ideas of letting go that we just spoke about, um, letting go of thoughts, letting go of people, letting go, the traditional understanding of letting go is very much based on the thoughts you think. Um, it's based on the images in your mind. It's based on external factors, people to get away from, right? Again, what we're going to focus on here is emotion. And here's something really crazy to ask. What if all self-help, what if all therapy, what if all psychology is wrong? And when I say wrong, uh, I don't know if you can see me right now, but I'm doing air quotes and wrong, okay? Um, it, it's not completely wrong. What do I mean by that? What if all psychology and self-help is wrong? Essentially, there's two formulations that most therapies, most self-help programs, most spiritual practices focus on. The first formulation that I think is wrong, again, in air quotes, is treating thoughts as primary. And it's very linear, right? So uh, this could include rational emotive behavior therapy. Someone like Wayne Dyer, if you know Wayne Dyer, he kind of built off rational emotive behavior therapy. If you've read As a Man Thinketh, if you've practiced stoicism, essentially what we typically try to do when we're going to change our life, improve our life, we try to change our thoughts first. So the idea is you change the way you talk to yourself, you reframe something, you recontextualize. And when you do that, your feelings change. And when your feelings change, your action changes. 
Again, rational emotive behavior therapy founded by Albert Ellis. If you've never watched a lecture with Albert Ellis, write this down, go on YouTube, watch a lecture with Albert Ellis. He was in New York City on the Upper East Side and he's hilarious. He's funny as hell. I love REBT. So when I say it's wrong, I'm not you know, trying to knock it. I'm just, <laughs> I'm trying to shift the paradigm a little bit. Um, but if you listen to the name, rational emotive behavior, th rational thinking, right? emotive, change your thoughts, change your feelings, behavior, you'll change your behavior. Okay. That's the typical formulation in most self-help. Everything you read, almost everything you read, every therapy you read about, you're typically trying to alter your conscious thoughts to change how you feel and improve life. And I'll explain why that's a problem, why it's again, air quotes <laughs> wrong. The second formulation, the second option uh, that you typically have to change your life is what I call the Tony Robbins option. I love Tony Robbins. So I'm not again, putting him down, but it's uh, action based. It's physiology based. You change your body language. You change your facial expression. You get into state physically, you know, he'll clap and clap and clap and he plays music. And it's all about moving your body with more energy and vigor. When you do that, you change your feelings, change your feelings. you change your thoughts. So it's this, it, again, it's linear. You change the physical state, this will change your feelings, actions, behavior. I'm not saying these don't work. One of, the case I'm going to make to you today is that they don't work well enough. It's not permanent. And it's not permanent because the, the primary focus should be emotion. You can also group into this things like meditation, mindfulness, positive thinking, affirmations, visualizations, prayer, journaling, etc. I'm saying this a bit tongue in cheek when I say these don't work, but um, they don't work well enough in my estimation, unless you do what we're going to talk about today. So what are we talking about? What, what, when I say make emotions primary, what do I mean by that? What is this better way? Well, the first thing I like to think about is instead of this linear path from thoughts to feelings, to actions or actions to feelings and thoughts, we want to think more in a hierarchical way. We want to think of kind of a base layer of emotions. So from feelings and emotions arise thoughts, more feelings, and more behavior. Okay, so we kind of flip it from a linear thing to getting to something that's underneath thoughts, feelings, uh, and uh, action. And it's this core of feelings and emotions that we're going to focus on. It'll be emotions that are generated in the moment, but specifically, we want to focus on emotions that have been repressed. We want to focus on emotions that are beneath consciousness. It's these emotions beneath consciousness that give rise to thoughts and feelings and behavior. And that's what we focus on. Now, we can make a distinction between thoughts, or be pardon me, between feelings and emotions. But for the most part, I just use them interchangeably here. You might say emotions are what happens to your body physiologically. Mm -hmm and feelings are the su subjective interpretation of what's happening to your body. But just so you know, generally speaking, I just use them as if they're the same thing. Okay. Just so you know that. I wanted to read this quote from As a Man Thinketh. If you haven't read it, it's a fantastic book. It's from the 1800s. But if you read this book, I can guarantee you underline this passage because everybody does. He wrote, a man's mind may be likened to a garden, which may be intelligently cultivated, or allowed to run wild, but whether cultivated or neglected, it must and will bring forth. If no useful seeds are put into it, then an abundance of useful weed seeds will fall therein and will continue to produce their kind. So he's talking about changing the thoughts in your mind to make, <clears throat> pardon me, the garden of your mind uh, beautiful, to make it uh, something you enjoy. I agree with this. The problem is what if your garden is built on a toxic landfill <laughs> and the toxic landfill we're going to talk about is all of this repressed emotion. Now the repressed emotion, we'll touch upon this again later. You could call it the shadow. You could call it the id. You could call it the dark side. Okay. You're getting into kind of the core of human nature. If you're a spiritual person, you might say it's the core of the ego that you're trying to get rid of. <clears throat> so just as I said earlier, when we focus on emotion, we're going to focus on them on two levels, emotion that is created in the moment and then emotion that has been repressed. Uh, sometimes I call them feelaries, memories as feelings, right? These feelaries that are beneath consciousness and they're, they're there uh, pushing on consciousness. They're there 
uh, making your life very hard, uh, very difficult. It makes you, makes you bo- they can make you bored, they can make you angry, they can make you sad, they can make you anxious. And it might seem a mystery as to why it's happening because they're just beneath consciousness. Here's something that I recommend you do. It's a, it's a major shift. It's another paradigm shift from trying to change thoughts to focus on feeling, but to also think of everything in your mental life as a feeling, everything as an emotion. So what do I mean by that? If you picture your grandmother or something, right? Sure, it's an image of your grandmother or someone you, you could think of somebody you care about or your pet. When you picture them in your mind or you say their name in your mind, essentially you're conjuring up an emotion of them. Your experience with everything and everyone in life is an emotional experience. So when I think of my grandmother, I'm thinking it's grandmother as a bundle of emotions. When I think of my job, I think of the job as just a bundle of emotions. So it's a it's emotion in thought form. It's emotion in image form. It's emotion in verbal form. It's emotion as a mental movie. It's emotion as a story, a narrative, all your relationships. Everything you think is an emotional thing. Now, if you do, I like to think of the picture of my grandmother's face as as an emotion. I see it as an emotion. But if you just want to think of it as a representation or symbolic of emotion or a thin kind of layer to emotion, that's fine too. The reason we do this, when we get to the actual method of letting go, it's going to help to think of everything as emotion. Because like I said at the beginning, you don't want to release thoughts because uh, that, that letting go of thoughts just isn't powerful enough. You need to get to this base layer this base layer of emotion. So start to think of everything in your mind as emotion. And as I just said, if we think of everything as emotion, when we start releasing emotions, it's going to be much easier. It gives us more to release upon. So typically at this point, I talk about the benefits of releasing. I like to give you a little insight into the dynamics and the structure of what letting go entails, but then to talk about the benefits of releasing should really motivate you to want to try this and do it. Because once you do it, once you learn how to release, I think it'll radically transform the way you think about self-development, self-actualization, and so forth. The number one benefit probably is fearlessness. Your fearlessness increases. And the reason this happens is because you're no longer scared of any emotions at all. You realize that everything, as we said, is emotion. And there's emotions that are bigger or smaller, but in essence, every, every type of emotion is the same, uh, the same emotion. The, it's made of the same thing. So like the fear of heights, that fear is the same fear as the fear of death. They're not two different things. It's just fear. The fear when you feel when somebody jumps around a corner and scares you, that fear is the same as the fear of death. Now, the fear of death might be far more intense. Uh, intense in the sense that it feels like there's more of it. It might trigger more layers of emotions, but it's still just fear. Uh, The reason that you start to release and you become addicted to releasing is because you're no longer scared of any emotion. It can be your anger. It can be your anxiety. It can be your depression. The sadness you feel when you see a Hallmark commercial or the sadness you feel when someone you love passes away, it's still just sadness. Oh, okay. Um, The sadness you feel when someone passes away or the sadness you feel at a sad commercial, it's the same sadness. So if you know that and you know what to do with the sadness, you can go into any sadness, no matter how severe. Your lovingness increases when you perform releasing. As you go into this repressed emotion, you become more loving because all that junk that's in your system, all the pettiness, all the and uh, all the envy, all the jealousy, all the anger, all the grumpiness starts to evaporate and it's easier to be loving. You also lose the fear of being loving. You know, sometimes there's this fear if I'm too loving, people will exploit me. And then you have this insight as you release that, well, no one can really take advantage of me if I'm always happy. How can somebody take advantage of you if they don't, if they can't upset your emotional state? So no one can take advantage of you. Somebody could steal your life savings and because you know how to release, they didn't really take advantage of you because you're still happy. So the, the great thing about this is you're just happy all the time and there's lovingness and there's forgiveness and there's this like extreme compassion for people. 
And you go into this repressed emotion, you're going into your dark side, you're going into your shadow, you're going into your id, right? And you realize that when people do crazy things, very often it's, well, almost every time it's their, their own shadow taking over their consciousness. So you go into this dark side in yourself and you, you start to realize what Montesquieu said. Montesquieu said, I've never seen a sin committed I myself could not commit. You go into the unconscious and you realize everything you see on the nightly news at some level, somewhere within you, that's a possibility as well. Now, you know, you're, you're also civilized properly. You have manners, <laughs> morals stop you. But generally, when you go into the unconscious, the unconscious doesn't live in society. It's still in the jungles. It's still on the Serengeti Plain, as one of my teachers told me. And that's absolutely right. It's still in the jungle. It's still, is, you know, it's either going to run away or it's going to fight. And when the unconscious fights, it wants to eliminate the threat, <laughs> right? So you... Um, you have compassion for people because you can see how the dark side can hijack consciousness. You know, you keep it repressed. Some people, it breaks through consciousness and it takes control. Now, what's interesting, not only do you have compassion for people who maybe lie, commit fraud, steal, kill, go to war, torture, like you have compassion for them because you know that's part of human nature, this dark side, but you also develop discernment. And this is important because I have friends who are very spiritual and their heart opens up. They're, they're extremely loving people, extremely compassionate. In spiritual terminology, terminology, you don't have to take this literally, uh, the heart chakra is open. You can just see it symbolically. And you know, it's like somebody committed triple homicide and they're like, look, they're sorry. Let's, let's let them out of jail on a hundred dollars bail, right? <laughs> it's very kind, it's very compassionate, but it's also <laughs> naive when you release emotion when you go into yourself you've been through the dark side so you also know how dangerous the dark side is so you develop discernment and you recognize that you can have extreme compassion for somebody no matter what they do but at the same time they might need to be locked up right so you, you also <laughs> have wisdom you have uh, in spiritual terminology your third eye opens as well so if your third eye is only open you can be cold and callous and not caring enough right it's like uh, lock them up and throw away the key and bury them under the prison, right? It's too judgmental. Mm -hmm. The goal is to release this repressed emotion so your heart's open and your third eye's mm -hmm. open, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So your third eye opens and your uh, your heart's open. So you have this, this balance of compassion and discernment, which mm -hmm. is lacking in the world. It's actually what we look for in great statesmen. It's what we look for in leaders. It's Abraham Lincoln after the Civil War and um, Sherman, after his march through Georgia, you know, not to to try to reconcile and not to, you know, like line everybody up who supported the Confederacy and execute them, which is a totally understandable thing to want to do, right? But to have compassion as well as discernment, right? To make sure you um, you handle the bad guys, but you also act with compassion. It's what we look for in great leaders. It's what MLK represented. There were... Um, I'm just going to, if you have a, I'm just going to mute that because it keeps coming. Um, it's MLK when, uh, you know, it's like he sees good and evil, but he's still acting with compassion. Your boldness increases as you release. And the reason the boldness increases is because you're no longer scared of humiliation, right? So uh, when I work with people on this, they can go and like talk to the person they're romantically interested in. Why? Why can they do this now? They can do this because even if the person rejects them, the rejection is just a feeling and they know how to handle a feeling. They know how to release. Okay. So to go to ask, ask for a raise, to apply to a school, I had a person who was going to take the GRE and when they were going to take the GRE, like their whole ego, their whole sense of self was wrapped up in this test. And if they failed the test, they were going to feel like less of a person. But as they released, suddenly they saw, even if they fail, failed the test and felt humiliated or something, they could uh, release upon it and find, uh, find peace. Elizabeth has a question. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Can you hear me? Yes. So I want to make sure I understand, and then my question is based on that understanding. So my understanding is that you said we don't have to um, – have be like in bondage or whatever fear emotions because they're all the same just varying degrees like mm -hmm. emotional categories fear is still fear whether it's a big fear or a little fear mm -hmm. or pain is the same but 
to me, it's it's not at all the same. In fact, the degree is what makes it significant. Like a small pain, and I put it in the message too, but I'll say it for the people listening. Like a mosquito bite, we experience that as like an itch. But a large pain, like having our arm cut off, that's totally different. And I think the degree is important because it's like a survival thing. So I'm having trouble because you're building on this premise that the motion is the same. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe the label's the same, but the degree is not. And that's very important. That's a really good point. Um, so the way I look at it is it's, it's very much related to something like the problem of evil, right? So you can look at the problem of evil as if it's two, there are two entities, good and evil, right? Um, where evil has its own existence and good has its own existence. I think a, a more sophisticated way to look at it, and St. Augustine talked about this, is you look at evil as a privation of the good, right? A privation of the good. So there's no such thing as evil. It's just good gets diminished progressively. And if there's less good, aka less God, that's what we call evil. Evil doesn't have an existence of its own. I like to merge the two ideas of something being... Uh, on this gradation and also having the sense of it being its own thing. So what am I talking about? How do I relate this back to your question? If you think about fear, if you think about pain, right? Pain increases in intensity. And as it increases in intensity, there might be a critical point where it feels like its own thing. So if you take water, right? H2O is H2O. As it gets colder, there's a state change where it becomes ice. Right? There's a state change uh, as it gets colder or hotter, it can become a gas, right? But it's still the same molecules. Now, if you're experiencing something incredibly intensely, it's going to give the appearance of being something different. Is it actually something different? I don't think it is. Uh, and I'll go through this because I've um, used this method for things large and small. And what I've found is uh, that fear is exactly the same thing. Now, it can have, in small cases and large, it can have a uh, reverberation through the body that's more severe. If it's held on to long term, there are going to be long term consequences that a small fear, for instance, wouldn't give. But what we'll find is as we go into the unconscious, the essence of these emotions, in my experience, is exactly the same at every level. The essence of what fear is, is exactly the same. Uh, if, if that's not your experience, I don't think it would impact the method. You could just say, okay, I'm dealing with fear type A here, and I'm dealing, dealing with fear type C here. You would still apply the same, uh, the same functional dynamics to the emotion you're experiencing. It's a really good question. But in my experience, they are the same thing in essence, even if the texture of them feels slightly different. It should feel different if it's bigger, right? But the essence of it is going to be um, going to be the same. I'll also add here uh, another reason, and we're going to get to this later, that the fear is going to feel That's different for a bigger okay. fear. There's a bigger fear will attract more layers of emotions. And we'll touch upon these layers in a second, but that's, I think that's another reason fear is the same, but it might feel different if it's quote unquote, a bigger fear. Great question. Great question. But you're um, saying that we can apply the same technique to me, what you're talking about is labeling. So labeling is not really important to me. Like if my body hurts, I don't have to have a diagnosis of, oh, it's stomach flu versus bacterial stomach flu versus viral <laughs> stomach flu. I mean, the labeling thing is, not as important to me as long as the method you're going to propose, which I guess you're going to get to, the application is the same. Yeah, I, I think you can. So there's a few, as we get to it, I mean, there's a few ways to release emotions. Sometimes it helps to label them, but as you get better at releasing emotion, you're essentially, it becomes almost nonverbal. You might use words just to kind of, you might use labels to get the emotions flowing, but essentially you start releasing um the energy, I don't want to sound too metaphysical here, but almost like the energy field of the emotion and it's, uh, and, and the physical associations with the emotion, you can release the, you can release the physical consequences of emotion. Like if you're getting ready to give a speech and you have a dry mouth, you're going to release the dry mouth and the shakiness. Um, 
you'll notice when you feel fear, you even small fear and big fear, very often the physiological um, after effects of feeling fear, or the effects that happen at the same time are very similar. They just become, again, a little more severe. And that can give the feeling of it being something different, like a different type of fear. But it's a, it's a really good question. I think as we as we go on, we'll, uh, we'll get, to, um, get to more of it. Um, I, th I think I saw another question, sorry. It, like Every time a new question comes in, for some reason it jumps up, so I have to scroll down. Are you gonna show us how to release? Yes, Lisa, I am. Uh, Artemis, did you have a question? And- uh, I just wanted to say, I kind of understood what you were talking about in the spiritual sense. Yes, people do, especially in my case with like my exes, people do so much to hurt. But if you are a spiritual person, in a sense, you will forgive that person. And that's the part I think that hurts me so much because I'm a spiritual person and it mm. just, it hurts so much, but I'm like, I'm still forgiving them, but I'm like, they have to stay in that place because I just, it doesn't matter how much I forgive. There's there, that darkness is real. And, yeah. you know, yeah. maybe like on a side note, I'll give you a little more about who I am, but I teach spiritual classes, but I'm also letting go of something really dark that happened to me. And mm -hmm. I want to forgive him, but I, I, I cannot have a relationship with him. Right. That's all I wanted to say. Oh, I'm sorry you're going through that. And I think we all are. And we'll pray for you and have thoughts for you. Um, yeah, it's uh, that, that discernment very often is something people lack. And it's why they get in that yo-yo relationship with bad people, right? It's um, be, because if, if you're compassionate, I think, you know, you believe in unconditional love until you fall in love with somebody who just isn't swayed by unconditional love. <laughs> You know, it's like you, you date a nightmare for a while and you're like, oh, unconditional love doesn't always work. Well, at least it doesn't work on the time scale we want it to. I do think unconditional love, our love conquers all. It's just, you know, the seed of the unconditional love is planted in people, but it doesn't always bloom when we need it to. So, yeah, I think having the discernment, you know, when you let go of repressed emotion, um, you're able to also stick up for yourself. You're able to look out for yourself. Okay. And do what's right for yourself, because it's not just that you're compassionate. You have uh, self-respect, you have true self-esteem because you're getting rid of these, these unconscious uh, emotions. And, you know, this leads to the next thing I was going to talk about. You actually become a rock for people. Like as people see you go through some really emotionally trying event, you become a rock for others because they see that and they know, okay, Artemis, handles things well, right? Artemis handles things well, emotionally. If you have a death in the family and you stay strong through that, and it's weird, you're strong because you're, the reason you're strong is because you're going into the emotions that are attached to the, to the death of a family member or something, right? You've gone through the emotions and others are kind of like flirting with the emotions, but then trying to block it out, shift context, et cetera, et cetera. So you become someone that others rely upon and you get over things faster. People notice that too. So you'll find as you release, people come to you when they have, when they have problems, you have uh, better relationships, especially if you're with somebody who releases as well. My girlfriend and I were laughing the other day, uh, 2023 went by and we, it was like, you know, early January, we looked at each other and said, do you realize we didn't have a fight all of 2023? <laughs> we just go, Shh, don't jinx it, you know? Um, but it's just because we both release. When you're in a relationship and you release, you can fast forward to the end of an argument. You know, when you have an argument with a lover and you do this, the, you know, you don't talk to each other, you stonewall each other for three or four hours. Then finally somebody makes a joke and somebody apologizes. And then you're on the couch watching a movie together, you know, and everything's fine. Well, when you release, it's like you fast forward. It's just like you fast forward to the end. You get to that point much quicker if anything arises. And because you're working on stuff in your own life, you become much more peaceful as well. Uh, let me just check the comments here. Oh, Elizabeth has to go. Sorry. Uh, it's recorded. So I hope you can, you can, um, you can watch more of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, can I give you, can you give an example of release? Yes, I am. It's coming up shortly. <laughs> I have to build up to that. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm going to go through uh, releases in my own life, uh, how I've used it in small and big circumstances. Um, as you release, your health can improve. And I think that's because your stress hormones probably go down. 
you heal in certain ways. You can also release physical things. Like if you ever have an upset stomach and you release on it, it seems to go away really fast. One of my teachers rolled his ankle and he said he released as he rolled the ankle, he let go of the pain and his ankle never swelled up. I have friends who have done that as well. It seems to work. Your energy levels go up. I think it's because your conscious mind doesn't have to continually push out this repressed emotion. What's really cool is your synchronicities increase. Now, if you're a spiritual person, you know, you start to think things and th these things show up in your life. Um, if you're not a spiritual person, you're going to experience these synchronicities as well. And you can think of it as the brain is no longer distracted by all this repressed emotion and therefore is paying attention more in the environment to the environment and noticing patterns it typically wouldn't notice. So the synchronicities were always there, but now that your brain's not as distracted by all of this emotion, it's noticing these synchronicities. Okay. Um, so the increase in synchronicities is fantastic. Like before I did my first lecture, uh, for letting go as if maybe six weeks ago, uh, I, I thought of this book I read when I was like 20 years old. It was called infinite mind by Valerie hunt. I just happened to have this fleeting. It's so weird, this fleeting thought of this book as I was walking to the seminar, my first seminar. And I go into this room, I'd rented a room in New York and they had a bookshelf there. And on that bookshelf, I look. And of course the first book I see is infinite mind. This isn't a very popular book. It's, it's, it's from like 1999 or something. And there it was. And I, I found it. And I said, of course, you know, you start to get used to these sorts of things, these synchronicities, uh, and you almost come to expect it. As you think about things, they show up a, a person you haven't seen in 20 years, you think about them and then, you know, the, you round a corner and there they are in New York on vacation. Um, your wisdom increases that has to do with the mixture of the, the merging of compassion and discernment. There's like this fusion of contradictory ideas in people who release a lot. It's like uh, the actionless action. You feel intensely active while you're doing something. And at the same time, you're witnessing what you're doing. So there's a lot of these. It's, it goes back to seeing good, uh, good and evil, seeing evil as a privation of good, a diminishment of good, but also being able to see evil as its own thing. So you like merge these contradictory ideas. That's part of wisdom. You can handle the big scaries. Um, the four noble truths, poverty, old age, sickness, and death, right? That, that's actually, if, if you get to the heart of what releasing is, you're going into the, the big scaries, right? <laughs> the, most, the most trying experiences um, for humans. Uh, you'll have an increase in spiritual experiences. You'll walk outside one day and you'll look at a pile of trash and it'll look like, you know, a, a Baroque sculpture or something. It'll look beautiful. My teacher talked about this and then you experience it and you go, oh, okay. It's not just, you're not, like imagining this. Rumi once said, this we have here is not imagination. You walk outside one day and everything's beautiful. If you're not a spiritual person, you can look at this as you've changed your brain chemistry in some way, right? You don't have to look at it as a metaphysical experience. You can just say the brain's been altered a little bit by this releasing. In my research, after I finish this, I would really like to get people in an fMRI scanner and see what's happening uh, when people release, see the changes that are taking place as people release. The biggest thing you'll find with this method is there's nothing you can't handle. And that's what I want to express to you, uh, you know, chiefly, when you think of letting go, think of emotion. And when you think of emotion, emotion is just energy. And if you can go into that energy and you know what to do with it, there's nothing you cannot handle. So we'll go on from here. Um, okay. If there's uh, any question, no question, usually right here, I just stop to see if there's any questions or comments before going on. And if not, I'll just uh, keep going. I'm going to talk about next what releasing isn't. And then, Christina, we're going to get to what releasing is. Uh, but understanding what releasing isn't is very, very important. And I want to talk about how you are a bad person, B-A-D. <laughs> I'm a bad person too. So uh, when I talk about being a bad person, it's obviously an acronym and it's tongue in cheek. Um, it's in regards to what releasing is not. And this is very, very important to get. BAD stands for B, blocking out, A, acting out, and D, dipping out. Now, dipping out was something I said when I was younger. I don't know if you've heard it. Some people don't know what it is. Dip out means you bounce. It means you escape. It means you leave. It means leaving or running away from a problem. Okay. So if you don't know what dipping out means, that's what it means. And when it comes to blocking out, how do we block out emotions? We might say, I'm just not going to think about this. I'm going to shift my focus. We might try to change the subject in our mind. We might try to reframe, contextualize. We might say something positive. We might try to breathe. 
we might remember our spiritual teachings. If we're a Stoic, we're going to re remember what Marcus really has said, you know, something about the environment doesn't dictate how I think, right? I'm allowing it to, but it doesn't need to. We try to, we try to change our thoughts to block out the emotion. Acting out, this is one that really confuses people because they think acting out is the same as releasing and it's not. Now, when I say these are uh, being bad, when you're acting in a wrong way by doing these things, I'm not saying these things have no place, right? Uh, I'll, I'll touch upon that again later, but like crying is not releasing emotion. Venting is not releasing emotion. Journaling, screaming, punching a wall. I work with a lot of guys, you know, they get mad and they punch a wall or something, right? Uh, talking is not releasing emotion, talking it out, right? To be clear, I'm not saying these are bad. If you need to cry, cry. If you need a, a good scream, scream, but it's not the same as what we're talking about here. That's the distinction. When we talk about letting go, it's uh, different than these things, these acting out of things. And I think there's a comment. Let me just finish this and I'll get to it. Uh, so what's dipping out? Dipping out is running from the problem. And there are healthy and unhealthy ways to do this. You can go work out. That's kind of like running from the problem. You can go hang out with friends, party, drink. Some people do that. You can fly out. You can go on vacation, <laughs> right? Um, Karen Horn, I said that you, you've probably had that vision where, you know, life's not going great. And you think, what if I just went to the woods and, you know, I lived off grid. I became a monk. And people would think, whatever happened to Dylan? I would just, you know, disappear. And nobody'd ever see me again. <laughs> uh, Karen Horn I, who was a neo Freudian, and she expanded the defense mechanisms that Sigmund and Anna Freud created. And she said this this desire to like run away, and isolate, and go off grid. That's a defense mechanism too. You're running from things you don't want to experience. But it is romantic, right? It's romantic that we'll go live in the woods. So this is how we act bad. B A D. These aren't. Um, these, these aren't actually releasing. They're not dealing with the emotions. I'm very interested in the method, but only allotted about an hour. How long is the seminar? It'll be about two hours and it's recorded, Perry. And I'll make sure I post, maybe I'll upload it to YouTube and then post the link in the meetup group uh, if that works for everybody. Um, so BAD, this is how we act bad. Um, I hear some other things I just I always point out because I think it's funny. Whenever you say, uh, it's, it's, it's a, essentially like blocking out emotion. Whenever you say I'm going to be the bigger person, that's a like dinging red alert that, um, <laughs> that you're probably repressing emotion because essentially you're, you say, I'm going to be a bigger person. It's laudable. It's a good thing to do, but you're probably blocking out the rage. You're blocking out the hurt. You're blocking out the, confu uh, the confusion. If you say nobody messes with me or they don't know who I am, you don't know me. That's repressing emotion. You're probably really scared. You're probably actually really angry and you're just using a little of that anger to express it. And there's obviously pride there and so forth. Uh, when you say, I don't care, especially in relationships that are in a rocky phase, you see two couples arguing and very often someone will say, I don't care. I don't care if I ever see you again. I don't love you. Get away from me. Right. This is reaction formation a lot of the time, because essentially what they're feeling is, please don't go. I really do care. <laughs> I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Please, please, please don't go. Unconsciously, that's what they're feeling verbally in their conscious mind, they're saying, I don't care, get away from me, right? You see that a lot in relationships. Sighing, very often when I worked in an office, I would, uh, the boss would say something and one of my coworkers, she would get so mad and she'd just go, ah, and that was her repression, right? Uh, some people click a pen, you see that a lot, drum our fingers. So there's a lot of ways we unconsciously repress emotions. Now, um, I think everything's slightly suppression. The difference the distinction Freud made was repression, was it happened unconsciously, we didn't know we were doing it. And then there's suppression where we consciously push something out of mind. I think most things are, we consciously feel the emotion and then the subconscious action to repress it takes over. But every emotion that we repress is conscious at some level to some degree, I think. Um, so why isn't, for instance, crying? Why isn't screaming? Why isn't going to a break room? Why isn't that releasing. Why aren't we getting rid of emotion when we do that? You know, you think you cry forever, it would empty the emotion. Why isn't that actually releasing emotion? Well, imagine like a pipe that's filled with steam, right? And it's about to burst. That's when some big emotional event happens. The, the pipe's about to burst. Crying, punching something, whatever you do, essentially what you're doing is you're taking the valve and you're, you're opening it and it goes, tss, and then you close it really quick. So when you cry, you're letting a little bit of the pressure out. 
a little bit of the pressure out, but you close the valve again. So all of that pressure is still right there underneath the surface. And usually like when you cry, after you're done crying, there's this fear that we just cried about isn't actually gone. So uh, the, the pressure builds up more because you add more fear to it. If you're a guy and you cry, there might be guilt about crying, right? Because you're machismo or something, right? So even when we cry, if, if you swing your fist and you hit a wall, you might feel better in a second. You let, you let a little bit out, you close the rest of the rage off. And now you feel like a dummy. You feel stupid because you punched a wall and you're a grown up. You know, you threw a dish and, you know, so the guilt builds up. So it actually can end up creating more negative emotion, more pressure after that initial release. But I want to stress, I want to stress, if you need to cry, cry. There's, there, there is such a thing as a good cry where the pressure is so much, you just got to let it out. It's good maybe to say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to work out and get this out of my system physically. But you need to know you're not actually getting it out of your system, right? You're consciously choosing to be bad, B-A-D, again, in air quotes. You're going to burn some energy at the gym. Except, essentially, what you say is, right now, I'm going to block this out. Right now, I'm going to go to the gym. Right now, I'm going to cry. I know that's not the same as letting go of repressed emotion, but this is what I need right now. I need to hang out with my friends. I need to talk to somebody about this. You do this, and you just say, I know that's not the same as releasing. So you can be consciously bad. So I bet you're wondering how exactly do we release emotion? What's the process? And I'll tell you right now, there's only one tricky thing here about releasing. It's the one thing that if you get, it's, uh, it makes the whole thing a lot easier. If you've meditated uh, for a long time, typically people who meditate get the finesse of this a little quicker. And it's essentially the combination of two things. It's witnessing the emotion and feeling the emotion at the same time. It's like two contradictory ideas because you're fully feeling and you're fully not feeling the feeling. <laughs> okay. So I know this sounds crazy, but it's totally doable. What we're going to find is that as we start to pay attention to our emotions, even the little emotions that we feel like, um, I think it was Elizabeth who was talking about the difference between large and small emotions. The reason we pay attention to the small emotions is because we'll find that they go very deep. Like just, um, just a little emotion can take us uh, into the depths of the unconscious emotion in our lives. So you, you have to kind of accept that you're sitting on a sea of emotion of anger, sadness, fear, guilt, shame, lost time, humiliation, pride, rage, like all of these emotions are within you underneath consciousness. Uh, you call it your dark side because these are quote unquote dark emotions that can cause us to act in ways that don't ally with our humanistic or spiritual aims, right? And of course, I've always said with the dark side, some people have like a Vanta black, pitch black dark side. Like it's very deep. It's very dark. And then you have people like maybe your, your grandmother who's like a light gray dark side. Okay. So there's variations here. Maybe it's karmic, maybe it's genetic, maybe it's both, whatever. Not everybody has the same uh, intensity of dark side, right? Or at least uh, their dark side isn't um, right near the, 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 the conscious mind, right? Some people's dark side are right near the conscious mind and can jump and take over very, very easily. But the dynamics, the essence of the dark side is all the same. All the same emotions are there. Um, I'm going to give you some examples of how just this little aperture opens when you feel a negative emotion that if you want to, you can go deep into the unconscious. So the other day in NYC, I was going up an escalator, right? And there's this disease in NYC. I don't know if you know this, but it's called Taurus stopping at the top of the escalator. <laughs> in NYC, you go up an escalator and uh, invariably a tourist will stop right at the top, pull out the map. And it's like, you know, this chain reaction of bodies <laughs> bumping into each other. And of course, somebody stopped in front of me and I have to like, you know, get around them. And I was just like, oh, how annoying. That's what I said. It's so annoying. And I said, oh, is it just annoying? And here's how you start to get into deeper emotions. I said, what did I really feel there? What was underneath the annoyance? And I think this is why like a small feeling like annoyance can feel different than a bigger feeling of annoyance because underneath are a lot of layers. And I, I investigated my emotion. I said, oh, it wasn't just annoyance. I, I felt immense pride. I would never do that. I would never stop at the top of the escalator. I felt morally righteous. I felt anger, right? That I just repressed by saying it was merely annoying. You know, the unconscious, the dark sides in all this emotions, again, still in the, uh, the jungles. It's still on the Serengeti. It is looking for an excuse to come out 
And its solution is to eliminate threats. Its solution can be physical, right? <laughs> it's like you want to kick them in the butt off the front of this, the escalator. And, you know, people who don't, who are super repressed, they will actually kick the tourist off the front of the escalator, right? Like it happens. So when you go into this little aperture of annoyance, it led to a feeling of superiority, moral righteousness, pride, anger, right? And you realize very quickly that we repress just by labeling something a minor annoyance, okay? Um, so here's, here's what you find. You go in through the little emotion and you find that these little emotions go deep and there's layers there. And more than that, they'll loop. So if you replay the incident in mind, if you start to release on this, you'll start to realize like you go from anger to um, pride to moral righteousness, and they just keep looping and looping and loop looping. So part of releasing is to go deep, go through the layers and allow the layers to loop. And we're going to get more into the, the details of this as we go. And I'll tell you a story about my girlfriend that's similar to this. So we moved to Florida from New York. Uh, maybe two years ago. I was get. I'm really bad with time. I think it was two years ago, 2021, maybe three. Okay. So um, she, we moved from New York to Florida. And one of the big deals in Florida, you can go to the pool. So my brother lives in an apartment complex with a pool. Her and her friends went to the pool and um, she's a tough girl. She's from Ukraine. She's been our own since she was 16. And, you know, so it takes a lot to get to her. And anyway, she was at the pool and I picked her up from the pools. Like she was there five, six hours. I said, how was the pool? She's like, it was, it was awesome. It was great. Except for this one thing, there was this guy there who was staring at us and it was super annoying. You know, it was just annoying. And anyways, we had a great time. And I said, Oh, it was just annoying. Was it? And she, she kind of laughs cause she knows me and she goes, okay. I said, what did you really feel when that guy was staring at you for five hours? You know? And she was like, he was being such a creep and just staring at all of us. And just like, it was really obvious. And she goes, you know, I wanted to look at him and say, what the are you looking at? You know, like quit looking at us. What the, right. So underneath her saying it was just annoying was this cauldron of rage. There was, you know, the, the frustration that she's a woman out in public and she can't be left alone. Like there was just so many layers there that she covered it up by just saying it's annoying. Right. And I think it's the first time she had actually, you know, we had talked a lot about repressed emotion and she hadn't really experienced it in herself. And then she goes, Oh, I see. I repressed all of that anger. I never dealt with it. I never released on it, right? She'd seen that her just saying it was annoying, her being a good person, her not causing a scene, right? That, that repressed the emotion, but it went deep. So again, I said, how did it make you feel? She, she's like, honestly, I wanted to skin them alive. She didn't say that, but you know, like, that was the energy. That was the intensity. Um, the point is we repress and we don't know it. We have manners. We're civilized. You know, and to a certain extent, this type of repression is good. It's how society functions. Now, there have been some philosophers on the left uh, mainly, but some on the right as well, that suggest what we should do is just allow our emotions out. That's if we're sexually repressed, we should have sex with everybody, right? Like that's kind of the idea of someone named Marcuse, right? It's like he took Freud and he said, well, Freud said repression is the root of all evil. Well, don't, don't repress, express, right? Well, what we just talked about, this expression, this acting out, doesn't actually get to the core of the emotion. You're letting a little bit out. It feels freeing, but you get all of these concomitant emotions like guilt and rage and pride and insecurity and inferiority that arise if you just express the emotions. You know, if you express your emotions and you snap on everybody, if you're someone who looks at them, you're a blunt person. Like blunt people essentially are um, repressing their love and repressing a bit of inferiority. Um, the other problem is as we, and I think there's a comment in here, I'll, I'll check in one second. Um, as we repress, as this stuff builds up within us, some people snap if it builds up too much. Like we used to call it going postal, right? The little stressors every day that the mailman went through uh, built up and they could quote unquote snap. Um, sometimes you're just going along with life and you've repressed and then suddenly you're in a swamp of sadness. You're in depression. Like there's just no joy in life. And other people, I work with a lot of people who have anxiety. Sometimes the anxiety just like builds up and you're, you're fine. And then you're walking down the street and suddenly it feels like the world's coming to an end and you're having a massive anxiety or a panic attack. And it can take people months or years to get out of that. And I think that's the consequences of not releasing emotion. It's the consequence of 
not going into this. Now, I will say, I'm, I'm thinking of this in terms of being a psychological thing. If you have some sort of uh, neurological condition or anatomical, if you have a tumor that's causing your anxiety, this isn't going to help you, okay? But uh, if it's just psychological, I think this mess. Okay, so not releasing repressed emotion, it just kills the energy and vitality of life, right? When you re release repressed emotion, you're happy all the time. I know that sounds crazy. I know it sounds like impossible, but you are, and I'll explain that more in a bit. So uh, something else you need to understand before we get into how to exactly to release repressed emotion is repressed emotion has eyes. I used to work with, uh, I tutored a lot in East Harlem and I lived in East Harlem for 10 years. And these kids live in a constant state of fear. They're in a dangerous environment, right? So they repress that fear, especially the young boys, because they, um, they know that uh, showing fear, sh acting scared will invite aggression. You know, the dark side doesn't, uh, when it sees uh, an impala with a limp, it, it doesn't elicit compassion from the predator. It's, it's just a target. You know, that's why you never want to show weakness to a bully or on the international stage, right? Weakness invites aggression. It's counterintuitive. So they typically puff up with pride. And this happens in Appalachia. This happens everywhere, right? Like um, if you live in an environment where there's constant threat, you're going to, especially if you're male and female as well, but definitely the males I worked with, you repress the fear, you compensate for that with pride, right? So, you know, you would work with these, these kids and um, essentially they would, uh, you know, you get about once a week or twice a week, there'd be some small scuffle in the hallway over nothing, right? But you have people who are repressed and that repression will come out. Um, of course, part of it's just maybe being a young man and hormone levels are changing too, right? But uh, when, you, when you have hormone le levels changing and you're in a threat environment, you know, and you're repressing, it's, it's going to come out. So repression has eyes. And this is one of the coolest things you'll experience when you're uh, learning to release. As you get in touch with this repressed emotion, you'll notice um, you're driving and somebody cuts you off. Now, the typical idea is somebody cut me off, therefore I became angry, right? Because he or she did that, it elicited anger from me. But as you release, you realize that I'd say 95% of the emotions you feel are old feelings looking for an excuse to come out. That pipe's getting ready to burst. So repression has eyes. You're looking out with your conscious eyes. Your repressed eyes, so to speak, are looking out into the world and waiting for any excuse to come out. Somebody just makes a benign comment, but you can twist it a little bit to make it an insult just so you can snap on somebody. That's that repressed emotion coming out. Somebody cuts you off, you get angry at them, and then you go, oh, I was angry before they cut me off. You'll catch this. I was angry before they cut me off, and it gave me an excuse to get angry. We know that the brain, there's something called blind sight. Essentially, it's like you flash something to somebody. Let's say it's a key, a picture of a key. They don't consciously see it. They don't remember consciously seeing it. But then if you give them an option of three objects, and let's say it's a key, a basketball, and a flower, and you tell them to pick one, they pick the key at like 80%. They don't know they saw a key, but they'll pick the key because the unconscious just processed that key, right? So it's beyond chance. It's called blind sight. You see things that you didn't actually see. So the brain can do this. It's interpreted, you're interpreting the uh, environment consciously, but the unconscious, and I think it's this repressed emotion, is interpreting the environment in another way. And as soon as it sees an excuse, it hijacks consciousness. And it's, you know, cursing out the sweet greens cashier for getting your change wrong, right? Like it just jumps out and uh, takes control of your body. So you've found this very, you'll find this very often as you release the guy cutting you off or who flipped you off. It didn't cause anger. It just released anger already within you. It's a really startling and fun discovery, actually. So let's get to what releasing is. Oh, okay. So I already mentioned this. But this is really the key of being able to release. There's more keys, but this is, if you get this, this will help you release. It's this mixture of feeling and witnessing, feeling and witnessing. Essentially, what you want to do is find the emotions that are beneath consciousness, these emotions that come in layers, and you want them to come up while at the same time remaining calm. When you're releasing the right way, no one will know you're releasing. I could be going through something very severe emotionally in my life, giving this talk 
and I'm still releasing and you wouldn't know it. Releasing is a very, once you get it, you'll, you'll realize that you can release in any situation, in any circumstance. Um, it's called backgrounding. I call it backgrounding. You allow the emotion to run in the background while you go about your day. We'll touch upon that more a little later. I should also note that um, as you release, you're going to be able to uh, get insight into the nature of your unconscious, okay? You're going to be able to get insight into the, the dynamics of your unconscious. So as you're witnessing, there's a part of your mind that can kind of record what's happening. And this makes you able, if you work with people, if you're a therapist, by doing this, this feeling and witnessing, it's going to give you a profound insight into human nature. As you go through your own nature, you're going to find how other, the dynamics of other people as well and how, how they operate. So um, I, another synchronicity, right before the same day I gave that first lecture and found the, the book um, Infinite Mind by Valerie Hunt, right before I went into the lecture, I, I, this showed up in my feed on Instagram. You can see it's a statue of, I believe it's Shiva in a flood. Now you'll notice Shiva in this flood is very calm as the flood goes by. This is a perfect representation of what releasing is like. Very calm as the flood of emotions go by you. So you're feeling the flood of emotions and you're calm in the flood of emotions. I've often referenced, if you know uh, the history of the Vietnam War, some monks had set themselves on fire to protest the war. I know it's a gruesome example, but if you're going through something truly severe, you're a lot like those monks if you look at the picture, it's gruesome. I don't recommend doing it, but they're calm as they're on fire. And that's kind of the idea that, uh, that you have when you release. You're, you're being burned by the emotion and at the same time, you're a witness to the emotion. I asked uh, OpenAI chat GPT-4 to create an image of a monk in a flood. And I just thought this was a really cool image. I think it represents what releasing is like. So I'll give you a physical example of how to release. And uh, it will help you start to understand exactly what, um, what releasing emotions is like, um, in analogy anyway. So if you pinch yourself, if you take your right hand or left hand and you pinch your other arm, right? So what can I do? If I pinch myself, I can block it out. There's pain there and I'm gonna change, I'm gonna think about something else. I'm gonna sing a song to myself as I pinch myself and I feel that pain. I can like hum a song and block it out right? That's B. I can act it out. I can pinch myself and go, damn, that hurts. You know, F, Arr! I can grunt as I pinch myself, right? That's acting it out. Or I can dip out. I can literally like yank my arm away from the pinch and shake it, like act out the pain. But when we release, what we want to do is we pinch ourselves and you can pinch yourself harder and harder, right? You can let the pain just radiate and witness it. So at the same time, you're feeling the pain. You'll notice there's a part of yourself that's just witnessing the pain. You do the exact same thing with emotions. You allow the emotions to come up, uh, allow them to come up in their layers, in their intensity, and you're witnessing and you're feeling at the same time. Now, there are some methods that deal with emotion, um, not exactly in this way, but the methods that deal with emotion, they don't really work because they don't go deep enough. What you'll find here is there's, you're going to a profound depth in these emotions and you're also going into, um, you're going into the various layers of the emotions and allowing them to loop. So that pinch, you know, it's a good way to practice releasing. I tell everybody, if you ever stub your toe, right, it's a great time to practice releasing. You stick your hand under the faucet, you expect it to be lukewarm and it's scolding hot or really cold. Anytime you feel just a little pain, it's a great way to practice releasing. When I first started doing this, I bump into stuff a lot. You know, I'll hit my elbow, hit my funny bone. I would go out and then go, nope, just feel the pain, let it radiate and witness it. So it's a really good way to learn how to um, release. Again, it's a simple demonstration. And I should note that emotions can have physical symptoms too. So it's also good practice for that. If you're getting ready to give a talk and you have dry mouth, you have a wobbly stomach, counterintuitively, what you do is you ask for, you ask for more, more of the, uh, dry mouth, more of the wobbly stomach, the weak knees. You want more of the emotion. This is how you burn through it. You don't repress any of it. You let it all come up without expressing it. You're calm and the emotions go away like that. The first time I gave my talk, it was a room for full of 50 people. And I had those pre 
uh, talk jitters, a bit of stage fright. And I said, great, this is a great opportunity to use the uh, method. So I just let the jitters come up. And at the first 30 seconds I was talking, I allowed all of the like shaky hands and everything to be there. I allowed the, you know, the layers came up. People see my hand shaking. I felt judged. I let the feeling judged come up. I felt guilty, you know, for not being calm and I'm teaching how to be calm. Like all of the layers came up. I released and in 30 seconds it was gone. I felt perfectly at home. And what's interesting is I feel perfectly at home every time I talk now. Just one time of 30 seconds of a deep release in the moment. Nobody knew I was doing it. And I was over the, I was over the, the stage fright. So uh, I'll stop here before we get into more specific ways to release. I'll, uh, I'll continue on. Um, so the way I release every morning is I write it out. Now, I don't want you to confuse this with journaling. That's not what I'm doing. I essentially write it out. I'll say, what am I feeling right now? And typically it's just an energy, but I'll give that energy a label. You don't have to write it out. You can just do it in your mind. And sometimes I do that. But typically every day I wake up, I roll out of bed. It's the first thing I do. I open my laptop and I say, what am I feeling right now? And I'll essentially say, okay, I'm feeling, uh, let's say anxiety about tax season, right? It can be something as mundane as that. I say, okay, what's underneath that? Well, I owe a lot in taxes and I don't have it. And if I don't have it, we, you know, maybe we can't go on vacation or something, right? Like I go through the layers of emotions and I just keep typing, but the typing isn't the thing. It's the feeling of the emotions. The other reason I typed and I recommend you do too is because I can go back 10 years and look at all of my releases. Like I can go to, it's today's April 7th. I can go to April 7th last year or four years ago and see what I was feeling that day. And what's interesting is when I first started doing this, there was like uh, 10 years ago, I would release and release. It would be like pages of releasing. Now it's like four or five lines every day, right? So that overall reservoir of repressed emotion goes down and you don't have to release as much because you're kind of emptying the total supply of emotion that exists within the system. And you're trying to release throughout the day as little things come up. I should also note right now, like if you get cut off in traffic and you feel anger, you can just release that anger. You don't have to do the layers every time. It's very healthy just to release you know, if you feel the anger to just release the anger in that moment, right? You don't have to do the layers every time. You can just release the surface emotion that you just felt. Uh, one thing I do every morning is I ask myself what happened yesterday that I didn't release on, right? Because I'll just quickly scan my, uh, my yesterday and I'll think, oh yeah, uh, I got that email that made me angry or I saw some politician say something stupid and I'll remember that. And then I go in and I'll release on something from yesterday. So you can time travel with this. You can do yesterday. Uh, when I first started, I had this memory of, I played basketball and I missed a game winner in high school, right? It went in and out and it, it still bothered me. So I time traveled back to that moment and relived it and felt all the emotion out. So you can go back in time to your childhood. You can go back to a past relationship and go into that reservoir of emotion. See, the mistake Freud and you made um, is they try to analyze emotions. They try to concoct a story and you get very intellectual when you're a Freudian. You can see how all the dynamic, how all these emotions, the complex of your unconscious fit together, right? You can write a great autobiography about, well, my mother did this and this led to this emotion and you know, this, this personality quirk or characteristic, right? You get very intellectual about it, but the structure of the emotion is still there. And that was the mistake Freud made. He thought you could just talk it out using free association. Really, all you're doing is finding the structure of what's underneath. And Jung took it a little farther with work with the archetypes. And um, I, I, for three or four years, I went deep into the dark side. I have another program I run called um, Discover Your Unconscious Through Automatic Writing. And um, I, the same way I kept notes with writing it out, I also went into the unconscious. And it's really fun. It's intellectually stimulating, but you don't, and you get great insights, but you don't make nearly as much progress in one month of hardcore releasing in my estimation in my experience you'll make more progress than in three or four years of certain types of therapies i'm not putting down therapy i think you should release in my opinion and then uh engage with your therapist or any type of therapy and i always tell everybody um i'm not just it's obviously clear i'm a neuroscientist i'm not a clinical psychologist i'm not a psychiatrist i'm not a therapist i'm not a counselor i'm not a mental health professional so obviously work with them 
their word is law. If they don't think you should do this, don't do it. I'm just giving you my advice and it's worked for me and a lot of people I've worked with. Um, so that's kind of the key to releasing is to start to every morning, allow the emotions to come up. And as you allow the emotions to come up, feel them out. And sometimes when you start, there's so much emotion there and you don't have a lot of time. So what I would do when I first began is I would release for 10 minutes. I'm like, okay, I got to go. I got I got stuff to do. And then what do you do in that situation? Well, there's two options. One, you can background it. You can let the emotions you're working on run in the background and you go about your day. And we'll talk more about how to do that in a little bit, but you might be able to feel it already. You know, when you, you kind of do this, when you, let's say somebody dumps you unexpectedly, that'll nag you all day, right? It'll nag you and nag you. And it's just kind of in the background. Well, we just asked for more of it. The other thing you can do is you can act bad when you run out of time. What do I mean to act, act bad? It's like you release for 10 minutes and then you say, okay, I'm going to block this out for now. I got to come to work. I'm going to come back to releasing on it later. You can just block it out, you know, but you do it consciously again. At night, I do this thing that's pretty useful called a hot shower. Uh, I don't do this every night, but it's a good way to, it's a good way to clear your day. As you take a hot shower, you can imagine all of the repressed emotion, all of the emotions you felt throughout the day coming to your skin, right? Like seeping out of your body onto your skin, like you're covered in emotional slime <laughs> and you're standing outside the shower as you do this, you know, you're standing in the back of the shower and the shower's coming down and you, and you just kind of mentally imagine all this emotion coming to your skin. And then you go under the shower and you look at the drain and you just imagine the hot water washing over your skin. You're feeling all the emotion and you're witnessing it go down the drain. It's a good way to, to clear the day. I, if you uh, send, I'll give you my email. And if everyone sends me their email, I can, I also have a, a program that's a uh, 10 ways to let go or surrender. And it has a lot of these visualizations that you can use to help you surrender. Again, it's about feeling the emotion though. It's not about the visualization. Um, Atlas shrugging is another uh, short visualization. You kind of feel the weight of your emotions on your shoulder. You know, Atlas held up the world and then you just um, shrug it off. Once you build up all the emotion, you just shrug it off. You can imagine Atlas dropping the world. But again, it's about feeling the emotion. I'll touch on burning. Uh, Lisa, yes, uh, blocking out is okay when it's done consciously. Right? You, you, the, what I say when I'm going to block something out is I'm not going to think about this right now. I'm going to shift focus. I'm going to come back to going through the emotions later. If it's conscious, you, it's good. Do you ever forget to? <laughs> okay, so that's a really interesting question. So <laughs> what happens with uh, this with this method is, okay, spiritually, um, you could say that this method threatens the ego, right? Um, if you were going to look at it from just the unconscious perspective, the unconscious is... Okay, let's take a, a little detour. When I, when I was doing my unconscious work, right, and I went into the dark side, I had this really interesting vision, understanding, right? Like going deep like Jung did into the dark side. And mm -hmm. it was this, the shadow of the dark side wants to move in straight lines, right? It wants to go from A to B as quick as possible. So the reason you get mad, the dark side get, gets mad when it's going along and somebody cuts it off. It's because somebody interferes with it getting to where it needs to go in the shortest amount of time possible. And it also theoretically threatened, therefore threatens the life of the dark side. You see, like if you're an animal or an early human, right? Like a hundred thousand years ago, and you're trying to get from uh, your house to the river to get water, right? Anything that interferes with you on the path to getting water is potentially a threat to your life, okay? Mm -hmm. So the dark side activates in these moments. And uh, essentially, uh, this attempt to keep you alive is what this, that, that's why this repressed emotion is there. It's attempting to keep you alive. And when you start to release emotion, you're, you're essentially saying these things no longer threaten us, right? Like the world, we, you know, we no longer live in the jungle. So, it goes, sometimes you go unconscious and forget to release. And I think it's actually that unconscious emotion somehow making you unconscious of the method. You forget the method, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's common people start releasing, they forget the method because you're diminishing the core of the ego. You're diminishing this thing that is trying to keep you safe. Another insight from working with the dark side is when you, what it wants is for you to thank it. So you can thank this repressed emotion. Thank you for being there. 
that also helps diminish it because it's the sole reason it exists is to keep you safe, to pull you away from threats or to make you engage with threats and eliminate the threats to fight or flight. Like if you get deep into the unconscious, when somebody cuts you off, what the unconscious wants to do is run that person off the road, right? It wants them gone. It wants them eliminated. It wants no threats. If the dark side could, it's not evil though, right? It, it, this is what got us through the, our evolutionary history. So it wants to be thanked. It wants to, it, it wants you to show it appreciation. Mm. So, um, it does go unconscious and you forget to do it. As soon as you remember, you start releasing again. So it's a fantastic question. Really good question. Yes. Uh, thank you. I, a really quick question though mm -hmm. is I'm really, I'm, I'm a New Yorker. I live in Los Angeles, but I'm, oh. I, I'm, I'm very, um, uh, what's the word? Um, I guess I'm a true New Yorker, right? You, you, you know your emotions, right? You're like, and I can be so pissed, okay? Uh, but I'll, uh, but I, and I'm a great writer, so I can write what I need to, and then I can call a really good friend and kind of get that anger out and express mm -hmm. it, where it's not directed to the actual person, right? If that makes sense, is yeah. that? See, I don't feel is that I'm not feeling I'm repressed because I go to the anger, right? <laughs> it's it's um, yeah. and I don't know if that's so healthy, but I actually do feel better when I like get it out. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it makes total sense. I mean, it it also depends on your your goals psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. Mm -hmm. um, if if you're somebody who's trying to not feel anger, right? Like you want to kind of be a person who's transcended reactionary responses to the world, mm -hmm. then you'll find that that anger probably is it might come accompanying guilt. If you have a different philosophy, anger might not be something that elicits guilt from you. It's just, uh, it's a functional tool. You can mm -hmm. also use the dark side. I made a program a long time ago called the killer instinct. And it was about using these negative emotions. You know, mm -hmm. I used to work with athletes and, you know, using fear, a little mm -hmm. bit of paranoia can wake you up early in the morning and get mm -hmm. you in the gym. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, using your anger can be a great motivator. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think as you try to maybe evolve psychologically, spiritually, like I'm not trying, I think it's a tool, but there's another way where instead of anger to a situation, you're trying to react with peace. And when you, so the world doesn't affect you. Um, it's interesting though, when you go into anger and you see what's beneath it, you might find that there is repression there. It could be a variety of things, right? It could, you could find out why you're angry. Mm -hmm. It's a survival strategy. It makes you tough. People don't F with you, right? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Which is very useful, right? Especially in New York. I spent 20, 20 Especially 20, in LA when you're a New Yorker. <laughs> that's for sure too. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, my, like people that have different personality types, like some people are more anxious, some people are more sad, some people are more angry, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I tend to fall to the anger like you. Mm -hmm. And one of the goals in life was to kind of diminish that, um, that reactiveness to the environment. And when I went into anger, what I found was inferiority, moral mm -hmm. superiority, mm -hmm. uh, pride, like an immense amount of pride. And, mm -hmm. you know, part of it's legitimate because you wouldn't do what some people do. Like some people are incredibly rude, right? Mm -hmm. Marcus Aurelius, like the first paragraph in his meditations is when you wake up in the morning, recognize you're going to run into scoundrels and thieves and liars and fabricators, you know, like prepare because those people exist. Um, and they do. They do. I mean, unfortunately. They do. So the question is, do you want to be someone who reacts to them with rage because you know they're there? Or do you want to kind of transcend their, um, their annoyingness? I'll tell you the story. I was on the subway. Mm -hmm. and I think it was like the sixth train or something. And mm -hmm. some guy got on the train. It was around lunchtime and he had nachos. Mm -hmm. And it was an empty train. And you know, the trains are, if there's nobody on, it can be kind of quiet. And he's mm -hmm. just chomping on these nachos with his mouth open. And I'm like, this effing guy, like, this is so effing annoying, right? <laughs> like, and uh, so this was, you know, probably five, six years ago. And I'm like, okay, it's annoying. What else am I feeling? Like, what did I want to do? I want mm -hmm. to grab the nachos, throw them off the train, throw him off the train, like get some manners. It's disgusting. Right. Mm -hmm. And I just went through this whole scenario in my mind. I felt it all out. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it probably took 30 seconds. And then at the end it suddenly released, it was mm -hmm. gone. I burned through this emotion. Mm -hmm. And um, when I looked at him again, mm -hmm. uh, he looked like a dog eating food. And I was like, Oh, if a dog was just chomping on food like that, mm -hmm. then, um, I would find it hilarious, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm still here. I'm just going to, my laptop is uh, about to die. So I'm going to plug it in uh, mm -hmm. really quickly, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm, I'm still listening, but so it just depends on your goals 
and um, what your motivations are uh, for 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 releasing or or not. But you know, I, I no, I think you have a really good point. I do need to be more at peace with mm -hmm. this stuff because. You know, I'm sure it's not doing great for my blood pressure. <laughs> yeah. Well, your blood pressure will go down uh, on the on on this method for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I had to. I, my computer just like said, "You're I'm dying in two seconds." Okay. So mm -hmm. I plugged it back in. Um, let me turn the camera back on. Okay. Mm -hmm. I had to change angle to plug this in. Yeah, mm -hmm. but really, really good. Um, really good question. There, there is. There's always a trade-off, right? Like I. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm working with an athlete, right? And I teach mm -hmm. them the release method. I say, listen, you, you can consciously choose to be bad. And mm -hmm. another way to be bad is to channel, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. sometimes I call it bad dash C. Another way to be bad is to channel the negative emotions that help you, right? Mm -hmm. um, like, uh, you know, when you, when you study athletes, they have this like, or, or great businessmen, there's like paranoia. Like mm -hmm. they wake up at 5 a.m. because they're like, oh, the other CEO, the other athletes waking up at 5 a.m right? Like somebody's outworking me. Mm -hmm. um, there's this great book by Zoja, who's a Jungian. And it's about the, um, the, the, the state of paranoia and the unconscious. And I took his kind of diagram of paranoia and I relate it to successful people. Like um, successful people, paranoid people have like this core delusion. Like for Hitler, it was the Jews mm -hmm. are viruses, right? Like mm -hmm. you, and if you've ever worked with true paranoid people, you can't talk them out of the core delusion. You might be able to shift them on some of the periphery stuff, but mm -hmm. that core delusion, you okay. can't talk them out of. And in successful people, they have something like a core delusion as well, but it's healthy. It's like Picasso picks up, I think his first word was pencil. He was going to be an artist, right? Tiger Woods is going to be a golfer. Mm -hmm. It's like, you can't talk them out of that. That's what they're on earth to do. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's, there's a lot of similarities between that and, um, between success and paranoia. So you can use some of these dark side emotions to fuel great success. Just Saint like Fran Van Gogh. I mean, perfect example. Exactly. For what sure. What is the name of the book or, or author that you just were mentioning regarding? It's, uh, this? it's called Paranoia oh. uh, by Zoja. Paranoia. I'll put it in the chat. It's hard to find in, okay. um, in, in, in print, but, um, or at least it was. And, and, and so a few people left. I will put my email also in the uh, meetup group. Somebody just asked that privately. I think it's already there. Is it? Okay, perfect. I, I mean, I, I think it was from before. I, I remember seeing it, but. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, there's um, one of the dangerous things. I mean, that's not to get too off topic here, but uh, mm -hmm. one of the dangerous things about paranoia and repression in society is that you, you, when you're dealing with repressed emotion, you're dealing with the dark side. Mm -hmm. And paranoia as Freud and Jung pointed out, unlike most mental illnesses, it's mm -hmm. contagious, right? So like when you live in a society that's possessed by paranoia, you get the Salem witch trials, right? And you can see echoes of this on the left and the right today, at least in America mm -hmm. and throughout mm -hmm. Europe. So you have to be very careful. One of the reasons you release is you actually, um, and uh, you know, th this is what I found. You, you tend to be, I don't want to say centrist because centrist sounds politically centrist. It sounds like you're just splitting the difference between whatever two general philosophies are held at the time. But I, I tend to call it centrist, meaning you start to find these core principles that um, not that America always lived up to these or anything like that. I'm not making that case, but like the ideals that like America was founded on a generic creator, individual rights, you start to find these things as you release, like they're there as realities and you align with whatever, par whatever party's aligning with those best. So you're politically agile or politically nimble right? Um, mm -hmm. that, that's part of the increase in wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would love for a politician to embrace releasing to a certain extent because you end up not um, projecting. So projection's a big problem. When you repress a lot, mm -hmm. Hitler, for instance, if you know Hitler thought uh, he might have been Jewish. And from a certain perspective, you can see Hitler hating the fact that he was Jewish. He, he lived in a very anti-Semitic Semitic region in a very anti-Semitic period in history. Mm -hmm. Hitler wasn't just a, um, like a one person who dragged everybody to anti-Semitism. That was already there. So he hated the fact that he might be Jewish. So you could see World War II, you could see the Holocaust as Hitler actually trying to kill himself, right? He's projected out what he hates within himself and he attacks it in the world. So when you look at a lot of global tragedies, a lot of genocides, it's a projection 
not always, but it's very often projection. That's the danger of repressed emotion, right? Um, of not dealing with it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little off topic, but like the bigger picture of why you repress is not only for your own development, but it makes every concentric circle in your life better the more people that release. Uh, your personal, yourself, the smallest center of the circle, your immediate family and relationships, then your like community, your neighborhood, then your town, your city, then your state, and then your nation. You become, I think, a voice of reason, at least the people I know and have respected who have released have as well. Um, you, you, did you say Hitler was trying to kill himself? Yes, yeah, symbolically, like abstractly, right? Okay. Um, yeah. So as he's trying to, I mean, he eventually really did kill himself. But uh, yeah, um, yeah. Um, essentially, it's like, uh, it's called uh, split and project. Mm -hmm. It's a classic psychodynamic mechanism where what you hate about yourself, mm -hmm. you see in the world. And if you really hate that about yourself, you will uh, try to kill that off. You'll try to eliminate it. You might run from it, or if you're the head of a nation, you may just try to kill all the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. In actuality, Hitler's trying to kill his own Jewishness, right? right. That fear they has within himself. So that's the, uh, that's the danger. Mm -hmm. um, Jill Bean has a question. Uh, do you want to say it, Jill Bean, or do you, is it in the, uh, in the chat? I, I can't see in the chat. The chat? Okay. Uh, so the question is, you are speaking of emotions and emotional brain, yes. What about if you have a disability or injury? For example, neurodivergent brains and different than neurotypical brains, TBI or injury or neurological disabilities, how can you accommodate? So if you have a TBI or you have a disability, I, I, I had somebody else uh, last session who had Tourette's. And what I told him was essentially releasing will help if, if, if a negative emotion uh, tends to trigger more symptoms, if you can release, it should decrease the symptoms that you, that you feel, right? Or, or decrease the severity or the frequency. Will it actually heal the TBI or the disability? I don't think so, but it may help on the periphery. That's my reading of it. I don't specialize in TBI or anything like, uh, anything like that. I, I'm more just into consciousness and the sense of self, but I don't think it would hurt to release emotions if you have, uh, if you're not neurotypical or uh, you're, you are neurodivergent or you have a TBI, it's worth investigating as always work with your psychiatrist, your neurologist, your, your, um, your medical doctor, talk to them, see what they think about it. Always go with, always go with what your, um, you know, your, your professionals say that's, that's my advice, but it's a really good question. Uh, I do know people who have severe anxiety and severe depression. If many of them have found, help with this uh, by using this method. It's, I, I don't know if it's a cure-all. I don't think it's a cure-all for those things. I do have uh, people who swear by SSRIs. I think when you're in trouble, when you need to heal, I think um, you're, you should be open to anything. When I was sick, it was anything. I heard a quote and it stuck with me forever. You never know where your healing lies. So you got to be open to Western medicine, Eastern medicine, therapy, medication, like maybe medications last on the list, last resort, but it should be a resort. That's my opinion. Great question. Thank you, Jill Bean. Uh, Antonio. Uh, hey there. I wrote the question in the chat that I like to see. Oh, I don't think I saw it. I'm so sorry. Can you repeat it? Oh, no, here it is. I see it. Okay. I'll read it. What advice would you give someone who suffers from, suffers from complex trauma and is highly emotionally dysregulated. Meaning when I feel anger, it is anger on steroids yeah, and same for some unpleasant emotions. It is hard to not let it poison my thoughts or bring me into a freeze trauma response. I know you're not a therapist. So I do have one. I would love your perspective in both a scientific and a spiritual perspective. Mm -hmm. So we come to this life, right? Uh, from a spiritual perspective, I'm a spiritual person, which makes me sort of a rare bird in neuroscientists. Most neuroscientists, I think it's like 97% or something. I heard that a long time ago believe that like everything's just brain chemistry, right? Um, I don't believe that. I do think there is something like karma. It's hard for me to reconcile evil, mental illness, childhood cancer, if there aren't things like karma. Now, I don't want to get into that too deeply right here, but sometimes we come into this life with certain maladies that we have to work through. We'll have certain life events we have to work through. There are certain um, people we have to work through. Uh, I was very sick at the age of 26. I had Lyme disease. 
And um, I've had, you know, through, through meditation and, you know, like uh, deep investigation, I've had experiences where I think I've tortured people in a past life. Now, if you don't believe in that, you can just say, oh, well, that's just, uh, you know, rationalizing or something, but it's very real to me. So when I went into the unconscious, I found this, um, this, uh, this memory of torturing people and it suddenly opened my eyes as to why I was sick. So if you have some maladies, what you want to do is just keep releasing, right? And also use everyone and everything in your environment in order to get better. So I tell anybody who has like uh, emotional dysregulation, anxiety, or depression, you want to attack it from all levels, which is one of the things my, uh, one of my favorite teachers told me to do is like, you want to look at it at a physical level, emotional level, psychological level, uh, and spiritual level. Physical, it could be like, okay, what can you do physically? I tell every single person that comes to me, again, I'm not a therapist, it's just a recommendation, cut sugar. As a matter of fact, try to go carnivore. I have a person um, that I follow. I don't know this person, but supposedly had bipolar disorder, very severe mental illness, went on a carnivore diet. And I can give you a whole lecture on why I think if you operate from first principles, something like carnivore or paleo is probably the best way to eat. Cut sugar, cut carbs, uh, even potatoes or something like cut all of that do it for 30 to 60 days and see if your symptoms are diminished. Another thing you can do physically is exercise. And I say do hard exercise and soft exercise. Hard exercise would be sprinting, right? Lifting heavy weights. Soft exercise would be Tai Chi or yoga. Try to mix that up maybe one or two times a week. You want to attack it from an emotional perspective. I personally think the release method is the best way to attack it emotionally. And then uh, you can also attack it psychologically. You can learn different techniques. The, when, when I said the, the techniques at the beginning don't work, what I mean is you should release first and then engage in REBT and then engage in dream analysis, right? And then you want to look at it spiritually. You want to start to have a conceptualization for why this is happening to you. And if you're truly a spiritual person, you start to see everything in my life is a result of some prior action, some prior thing that I've done. Now, karma, people misunderstand. They think, oh, I punched somebody in the face and therefore I get punched in the face. But that's kind of a, I always call it a Newtonian way to understand karma. Karma is more kind of quantum probabilistic, right? If I slap somebody in the face in a past life, that slap in the face is going to be mitigated by my good karma. Maybe I helped an old lady cross the street. So instead of getting physically slapped in the face, somebody says a comment to me that feels like a slap in the face. So it can be symbolic, right? Maybe you, um, in your past life, you rip somebody's tongue out with tongs so they couldn't speak. And then in this life, you're quote unquote canceled or deplatformed, right? So symbolically, it's kind of the same thing. Or the emotion you felt when you did something in a past life comes back as an emotion in this life, a similar emotion in completely different circumstances. When you release deep enough, what happens is you become okay either way. When I was sick, it's weird, but you become okay if you get better, you become okay if you don't get better, you become okay. If you live, you become okay. If you die, but it's not just okay. You're excited to live and you're excited to die. Right? So there's um, attack, whatever you're going through on every level. I think releasing is kind of a fundamental way to start to heal and make progress. Uh, okay. Anthony, you have another question. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I guess to follow up on that. Um, how do I know if I'm doing this right? Like how do I know I'm not just like, I don't know, falling into the, I mean, I understand the DAD thing, mm -hmm. uh, but like, if I consciously choose to release, like, how do I know the right I'm supposed to feel, how am I supposed to, to visualize in my mind? Great question. I think the one, you're going to just kind of know you're doing it. You know, that's why I like to write mine out a little bit because you can look back and you can see the things you're going through. And don't be like dismayed if something, you have to keep releasing on something or it comes in like, uh, it keeps coming back. It's okay. It's all par for the course. But um, I'll, I'll quote Vivekananda, who is a Hindu mystic. I don't agree with everything he said, but I thought this was a really great quote. He said, the number one sign that you're making spiritual progress is an increase in cheerfulness. Okay. So have you ever had one of those days where you wake up and the temperature's just right or something and like the lights just right and just feels like the world is perfect? You'll start to have that feeling more and more often. You might just be walking along. Maybe it's only fleeting at first, but it's a good sign you're making progress that as you, um, as you release, you start to have uh, the, these, these moments of bliss. 
or something that used to set you off doesn't set you off as more. I was uh, one of my teachers who released was telling me that um, he had a terrible fear of heights and essentially he had been releasing on other things, right? Just like his fear of giving a public lecture or something. And he said he went to the Grand Canyon and, and a long time ago, he couldn't get within like a hundred yards of the edge. It was just terrified of heights. He had been releasing on other things. And then suddenly he ended up, he could, he hadn't worked specifically on heights, but he had went to the Grand Canyon. He could sit down and hang his feet over the edge. Whereas before he couldn't even get close to the edge. Right. So you'll start to notice uh, as you release one thing, you are able to release uh, our other things are diminished as well. So that's a sign. But it's it's kind of a joke in releasing circles. You don't know how much better you're getting, <laughs> but maybe your friends and family notice, right? And that's why you keep notes and you, you start to pay attention like, oh yeah, I used to be absolutely scared of needles and now they don't bother me as much anymore. It's little things like that. But I think you're just generally going to feel lighter. You're going to feel happier. The beginning when you first start releasing can be very intense because you've never done it before and there's a lot of, sorry, part of my language, shit there that you got to go through. But as you do, it's, uh, you start to feel lighter. Um, I, I call it floating. Very often you float, you feel like you're floating through life. Everybody else is weighed down by everything. And you just feel like you're this high off the ground, just kind of like cruising along. I think uh, the deep release, the more you do it, you start to embody the concept of wearing the world like a light garment. That's what releasing does. You're actually not attached. You're not avoiding thing. You've released on aversions. You've released on attachments. Aversions and attachments are just emotions and you start to release on those and you kind of go free of the world. And I guess the number one sign is you start to become uh, excited for death. I know that sounds crazy, but um, that's what happens. You start to get this uh, insight into the nature of the soul or you become Socrates about it, right? When Socrates was going to die, he said, death is one of two things. Mm -hmm. It's like sleep at night when there's nothing there. That's not too bad, right? I'm not there for it. No reason. Roger Bacon said, no reason to fear death. I won't be there for it. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. Or Socrates said, it's uh, I get to hang out with my friends forever. Mm -hmm. Like those are the two options, right? So you either have the intuition that you get to hang out with your friends forever, so to speak, or that it's no big deal. So another sign is like the fear of death diminishes as you do this work. It's like replaced with an excitement. Really good questions. I'm coming out with a, a book on um, this that I'm working on right now. And I go into that way more in depth, um, what I think is happening. I also touch upon what I think is happening in the brain. It's not like, like, obviously the neurons aren't just caking up with emotion, right? Like that's not repression. I think it has something to do with the frequency with which we're warned about emotions um, by the brain. Remember, it's that repressed emotion is our survival. So I think that something that worries us, scares us, could hurt us psychologically or physically, it dings constantly. And that dinging, the frequency of the dinging of it reminding us, hey, there's a problem here. That's what that's one theory I have of what repressed emotion actually is in the brain. But great method. Lisa asked uh, privately, did you create this method? No, I've expanded on it in a few ways. It was originally created as far as I can tell. I mean, there's other spiritual. You could you could think of Buddha when he's facing down Mara and all of these demons. Right. He's sitting there passively and all of the. You could think of the demons as all of these emotions, all of this karma and he's passively experiencing it. I, I think it goes back to like the Buddha. Um, it wasn't articulated this way, but that's what I think it is. Uh, Lester Levinson is the guy who created it. Now, spiritually, Lester Levinson supposedly had a fall. You can watch videos on him. Uh, everyone I mentioned is a much better speaker and presenter than me, and I highly recommend uh, watching them. Um, Lester Levinson essentially had a heart attack. He was this engineer living in New York City. I think he owned some like apartment buildings or something. <laughs> And anyways, he was, a, he was doing Jungian analysis and Freudian analysis, and um, uh, mainly Freud. And uh, he had this massive heart attack, and he went to the doctor, and they said, look, your heart's so messed up. This was like in the 1950s or something. Your heart's so messed up. <clears throat> if you take one step, you might drop dead. If you go up like a flight of steps, your heart might not be able to take it. Mm. So he's basically sent home with this death sentence. You know, they don't have the techniques we have today. And then he, uh, he realized after doing Freud, you know, Freudian work for all of these years that they just intellectualize everything. What if you just felt the emotions and did nothing else? So he came up with the release method. It was later renamed the Sedona method. And then uh, a guy named Hal Dworkin, who was a student of Lester Levinson, he does the Sedona method, very similar to um, 
what I'm talking about here. And then what made it somewhat popular again was David Hawkins. Uh, if you know him, uh, he, he was a psychiatrist in New York and then he wrote Power Versus Force. And then he wrote a book, uh, Letting Go. And I built essentially most of this program off of that book. Uh, I had been doing something somewhat similar, but that just crystallized everything for me. And then uh, I started, you know, after doing it every day for years, I saw some ways that I think it can be expanded. Um, I've found some ways to, uh, I'm hoping to tie neuroscience to it. So that's mm -hmm. my contribution. But um, David Hawkins' book, Letting Go, would be better than my lecture. Um, Lester Levinson's talks would be better than my talks on it. Um, Hal Dworkin, Sedona Method, also very good. I think I add some new things that are interesting. Uh, but there are there is uh, a history of this. Um, it's surprisingly, a lot of academics haven't took it up, and I don't know why. So another thing I want to do is bring some more research to it, and maybe I, I'd really like to start a certification program, um, and not charge an arm and a leg, right? Like I want to run this as a nonprofit um, to help people get certified if you're a therapist and you work with people, because for me, it it, it radically transformed my life. I don't have a bad day. You know, um, I can't remember when I've had a bad day. And that's saying- When did saying, you start doing this? Sorry, not to interrupt you. When did no, you no. Uh, I would say it was 2013 or 2014. I should go back and look at my notes. When, when I first started doing it, I didn't type. That's why I'm not exactly sure when I started. I just kind of did it mentally. And I thought, man, I'm getting so many insights. Uh, I'd love to have a track record of this. So that's when I started waking up and typing it out, you know, and um, following it. So it's been uh, more than a decade for sure. What were you doing before this? I would use a lot of visualization, rational emotive behavior therapy stuff, um, you know, reframing thoughts. I would, um, I was into, I almost went to be a, a Freudian analyst when I got out of undergrad. Mm -hmm. And then um, I, I would say a lot of spiritual stuff too. A lot of- You were always in the psychology arena, it sounds like. Pretty you know? much, yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, I, I would say that's true. I, I think from the age of like 16 to 23 or 24, I read nothing but spiritual and psychology books. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, I expanded a lot. I read <laughs> a mm -hmm. lot of political books, a lot of like I've, almost mm -hmm. every novel you can think of that's well known I've read. I just kind of like in my mid 20s became, uh, I wanted to be more intellectual because I was looking at like the self-help movement in psychology and I thought there's not, it's a, I, I want to ground it in history. You know, like I want to, I want to tackle the, the major, like, you know, we're talking about Hitler. And when I give other lectures, I talk about the rape of Nan King and these things, because mm -hmm. that also has to do with the unconscious and psychology. And I don't think self-help touches that enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a whole other story, but yeah, I've always been interested in psychology and the mind. And then um, neuroscience uh, was, uh, so I became a little more tech savvy, a little more biological, biologically savvy, and um, we'll do a PhD in neuroscience as well. Did I hear so you correctly mm -hmm. that you started these workshops only six weeks ago? I did. So I'm a big fan of the Bob Dylan song, Know Your Song, uh, or the lyric from Bob Dylan, Know Your Song Well Before You Start Singing, mm -hmm. right? Like I wanted to know this method inside and out. I mm -hmm. wanted to use it for not just getting cut off in traffic or getting, mm -hmm. you know, stopped at the top of the escalator, but uh, mm -hmm. I went through a bad breakup with it, which I usually talk about. I'll maybe do it next time we have a lecture. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, death in the family, sickness mm -hmm. in the family, my own sickness, mm -hmm. poverty, business failure. I've used this method for so many things and I've had friends use it for so many things. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be completely confident in the method. I wanted to know the method inside and out, the mm -hmm. dynamics of the unconscious. And I just finished about three months ago, my deep dive into the unconscious. Mm -hmm. So I started to feel more competent talking about this and confident when I tell people it works that it's mm -hmm. uh, that it does work and it's very useful and i'm also mm -hmm. writing uh, papers on it now uh in regards to the neuroscience potentially behind it so mm -hmm. that's that's why i didn't do any um any uh lectures or anything until now. i think two years ago i did release a how to let go program mm -hmm. um but i didn't do it in person until i think it was six weeks ago i'd have to check i'm so bad with time it might be eight weeks i don't know but it's, well thank it's i mean thank you for bringing this you know, to light and to even offer this as a workshop. Of course. Yeah. And uh, I, I appreciate everyone showing up uh, for it. And I hope to do one. I'd love to do some in person. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be, that would be ideal. My dream is um, uh, I was, I was also going to, let me do this before I forget.
Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a link for a download that kind of summar summarizes everything. Let me paste it in the chat. Um, uh, to, to eventually, like maybe in New York, get uh, a small room, like a thousand square foot room or even smaller than that, set up mm -hmm. chairs and like do these in person. Hopefully people can like fly in and do them because mm -hmm. it's so much more fun in person. If people mm -hmm. are uh, more likely after about the first 20 minutes to chime in, you know, mm -hmm. and see, it's hard to chime in on Zoom, you know, it's because mm -hmm. like, do I raise my hand or do I just unmute? What do I do? Mm -hmm. um, if you click that link, I just put in the description, it'll give you a PDF download and mm -hmm. feel free to, uh, you know, check out this. I, I just started this six weeks ago too, the letting go institute.org. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just getting stuff up there. I'm going to try to do more blogs. I have more videos and I'm eventually going to move the program over to the, uh, to the site. So you'll have videos of this as well um, to check out. And this is uh, my personal site. If you're interested, dylanfreed.com. <clears throat> so yeah, I, I hope it really helps people. Um, Again, if it doesn't work for you, I always tell people, if it doesn't work for you, don't use it. But so far, mm -hmm. I haven't found anybody this doesn't work for. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to work really, uh, really well. And um, it, it works in tandem with whatever else you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I love it because you can do it in the moment, right? Like I was talking mm -hmm. about getting that speech. You can do it in the moment. You can do it while you're driving. You don't have to sit down, close your eyes, get in the lotus position and chant a mantra. Right. I'm not putting that down. I love that stuff. Mm -hmm. I think it's awesome. But it's a, uh, the other thing is, have you ever found a method that works for a little bit of time and then just stops working? Right. Like you think you found something out and it, it's working really well, but then like three weeks go by and it, it just, you're doing the same thing, but it's not working. I've done this for 10 years and it works every single time. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I didn't get to, but I should mention is mm -hmm. no matter what you're feeling, that's an emotion. So if you're feeling nothing, that's an emotion. If you're feeling blah, that's an emotion. Mm. If you're feeling like you don't know what to do, you're confused, that's an emotion. If you're not sure how to use the method, that's an emotion, right? Everything, every objection that comes up, feeling nothing, feeling flat, it's all emotion. Feeling just blah is an emotion. So when you start to do that, you can release on anything at all. And, um, you know, it kind of opens the, uh, the pathway to those deeper emotions. And if anybody, I'm just throwing my email in the chat as well. Um, if you need to email, if you email me, I'll send you uh, the letting go program. I'm actually re-recording it right now. So it might be a week or two um, because my initial, I just did it like this on a computer with a bad microphone. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm re-recording it with a better microphone. So it might take a while for me to send it to you, but I'll send it. Um, yeah. If, um, are there any other questions? And I'm going to try to set these up uh, again every other month or so in LA. And yesterday I did Seattle and we'll cover a lot of the same material. So it'll be a good refresher. And then I always try to throw something new in as well. So hopefully you'll get something out of it, even if you come more than, uh, more than once. No questions? Cool, cool, cool. Well, I had, I had a great talk. And I hope the weather is nice in LA today. <laughs> today it is. <laughs> awesome. Wait, awesome. we're all, wait, we're, everyone that's online right now is in LA? I think so. Oh. I believe they are. Because uh, I, so I have different groups. I have uh, meetup groups and, because they make you do it. I wish I could just advertise it nationally. Oh. You have to pick a location. Oh, Okay. Got yeah, it. so this is my LA meetup. I guess meetup is supposed to be meetup in person, so it makes sense. Uh, so. <laughs> no, there's a there's a lot online now, though. I mean, yeah. most of the ones I'm seeing now are online; they're not in person. Even yeah. though they're even though ones in Pasadena that I did recently, mm -hmm. which is not far from where I am, right. it was still online. So yeah. online's great, but I really do love in person. It's so nice to like make eye contact with people, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. Am I able to give like just a quick example of something that happened and just to go through like the emotion? Yeah, for sure. I'm just curious how to how to like yes. do this because it's a recent thing that happened. <laughs> and I'm just like, yeah. I, it fired me up and I'm still kind yeah, of yeah. fired about it. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't, I hate being, you know, as a New Yorker, I, I'm a you know straight shooter. And I like to surround myself with people like that. Unfortunately, right. I always can't, I can't always, I have a kid, he goes to school, we deal with 
you know, administration that that's a whole other thing. But basically my son wanted to do a, a birthday gift for the custodian, which I thought was really nice. Oh, very nice. Great idea. So thoughtful. What kid? He's 14 years old, wants to do a, a, a gift. And I'm like the queen of themes. So I put this whole thing together. He's going to Las Vegas. Everything came together beautifully. What happens? My son leaves it in the principal's office to give to the custodian because he had waited for 20 minutes. They couldn't get him down. Cut to... I don't find out till two weeks later, mm -hmm. he was opening his gifts and then was holding on to these gifts in the <laughs> office. I'm finding this out. And boy, did I write an email that um, was like, what the, you know, I mean, I, you know, I didn't say what the hell, but like, I, I, I was so, I wrote, I'm so emotion. I'm so dumbfounded. This is like so unethical. Like, <laughs> you know, this, you're laughing. Okay. We, I'm glad we can laugh about this. I'm furious. Yeah, no, it's it's okay. totally unethical. Yes. I mean, okay, it's, but it's... I'm so furious. Like who the hell, what are you doing opening somebody? I know that was the other thing. Like you shouldn't be opening someone else's gift. Okay. Okay. So I felt superior, right? Because mm -hmm. now I'm telling her what she should be doing, but but basically, it was so upsetting. So, of right. course, I go to the district with this because I'm like, what the heck? What kind of, what, you got a principal, hoping whatever. So she's still lying to this day. I'm going to believe the custodian that's telling my kid she opened my gift. You know, she, well, he'd have no reason, you know, but she's still saying she didn't. It still took me reaching out two weeks plus a day for him to get his gifts. And I got scolded because I put a small bottle of champagne in that they, the whole thing about not having alcohol, I guess, on campus. But my point was, it wasn't for him to drink on campus. Right, and, right. And I have a friend from New York who's taught for 31 years. I actually sent a picture of the bottle that she was given that was adorable from her former student that said something like, um, you, my, 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 my child might be the reason you drink. Here's a drink on us. And it was the bottle with the kid's face on it. She blocked out the name of the family and it said the blank family. To basically, you know, ex nobody had a, anything to say back of, about the alcohol after I sent what I sent, you know. Right, 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 but, right. but the point was, this woman has lied. <laughs> you know, it's 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 infuriating because he didn't get the gift for his birthday because she held on to it for two plus weeks, coming at me that he feels uncomfortable about accepting the gifts, which is be baloney, but. It was, I'm sure they made him feel uncomfortable. Oh, why you, you know, you can't have alcohol. So anyway, what do I do with all this? Well, and what emotion? <laughs> it's, a, it's, yeah. it's actually, it's actually, okay. So like, yeah. uh, here's, <laughs> this is why you're happy. Even when you're not happy with releasing, this is why I can say I've never had a bad day or mm -hmm. haven't had a bad day in a very long time. It's because mm -hmm. I was watching this show on a, I forget what channel it was a few years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was a hoarder show. Mm -hmm. And you, you've seen these shows, right? Where uh, somebody's lived in this house for 30 years and never thrown anything out. There's like mm -hmm. diapers from 1973, dead mm -hmm. cats, right? Mm -hmm. And like most of us go in there and immediately start vomiting, right? Mm -hmm. It's disgusting. Mm -hmm. Well, this woman, uh, this woman would go into the house. She was like a cleaner mm -hmm. and she walked into this house. And I never forget this. It was like just filled with shit. And mm -hmm. she was smiling. She's like, oh my God, this is awesome. Because she said it's awesome. She said it's awesome. Her passion in life was to find hoarders and turn their life around to oh. clean up the mess. Right. So what happens when you release, when you find like an emotion like this, like this intense emotion, justifiable or not. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like being a whore. It's like you're this person who likes to clean up uh, a bunch of cr trash. Mm -hmm. Right. So. I always think of that when I find something that like sets me off, mm -hmm. I think this is exciting. I just found something I got, I get to clean up. So you're happy even when you're not happy, mm -hmm. but you can find in this, see mm -hmm. what happens is you would think you release and you you turn into like, have you seen the movie office space? Like from a long time ago where yeah, the guy yeah. just says, I'm not going to work anymore. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. my TPS reports. Mm -hmm. Actually what happens when you release is you're able to think rationally. You're able to think clearly. You're better able to express yourself. You're better able to mount a defense if that's an offense or defend yourself. Mm -hmm. You become clear headed. So just mm -hmm. what you were doing there, you know, you notice the moral superiority, mm -hmm. the disgust maybe, or the mm -hmm. dismay with this person. Yes. Like, who does that? So you're yeah. finding all of these emotions. And again, mm -hmm. they can be useful, right? Like mm -hmm. it activated you to take action. 
-hmm. But uh, when you release and you go through these emotions and they loop, right? They loop like you feel pride. It's not like you go through the layers once. That's what gets people yeah. stuck up sometimes. You get, they'll keep looping and you go through the loops until the end and they do end. People think that it goes on forever. It doesn't. Um, so you just go through these and you might find something else, you know, something like from childhood might come up that pissed you off where somebody did something similar, right? Mm -hmm. Abstractly. Like mm -hmm. as you go through these emotions, um, mm -hmm. you also don't get yourself in trouble. Like when I look back at my life, every time I'm like, oh, why did I do that? It's when I lost my temper, mm -hmm. right? So the other thing it does is it saves you from yourself. You know, you can take the temper too far if you have a temper, right? Mm -hmm, <laughs> like mm -hmm. we've all done it if we have a temper, we can take it too far. So it saves you from yourself. So it's good to sit down, but don't intellectualize it. You really want to feel the feeling. Like if it disgusts you, let it really disgust you. If you're actually mad at this person, what did you want to do? Take the gift and smash it in this person's face, right? Like get into the unconscious, what you're really feeling. You don't hold anything back. There's a book by uh, Joseph Conrad called Typhoon. And essentially I'm taking this quote a bit out of context, but the captain says, through it, through it, that's the only way to handle things. So like most people, they're on the, the sea and they see a storm, they go the opposite way. When you release, you see the storm and you say, I'm driving right into it but you got to be honest. It takes brutal honesty with yourself to really release. It has to be extremely brutally honest. And what did you want to do to this person who was doing this crazy thing? Uh, the other thing I'll say is just like another tactic mm -hmm. that's sort of like releasing, mm -hmm. but it's, it's more just kind of a fun way. There is a way I wanted to make a program on this. There's a way to go through life where you're like uh, Larry David or Jerry Seinfeld where it's like you're grumpy all the time, but you're just mm -hmm. kind of having, it's a humorous grumpy, right? Mm -hmm. I know people like that. They're some of the happiest people I know. They're New Yorkers mm -hmm. and everything flips them out, but inside they're smiling about it. It's everything's a situational comedy mm -hmm. and they get amusement out of people like that who did this, right? It's like mm -hmm. you're mad, but you're also, it's kind of like the joke. You're so mad. It's a joke. Mm -hmm. Right. So that, that's another way to kind of go through life. <laughs> it's like an archetype, the grumpy comedian. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can also be that it's, a, it's all a choice, right? It depends on your goals. It depends on your aim. The, the number one thing I would say, and just to wrap this up is nobody takes advantage of you. If you're feeling the emotions you want to feel right. And generally that means you're at peace. Nobody can take advantage of you. If you're at peace, this principle does this. And from a certain perspective, if you're feeling an emotion, you don't want to feel mm -hmm. then, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're actually being taken advantage of, exploited by this person. But like I said at the beginning, if somebody steals 100 grand from you and you don't lose your peace of mind, um, but if nobody takes advantage of you, then, mm -hmm. you, then uh, or you don't lose your emotion, nobody takes advantage of you. So this teacher does this, you release on it as you feel it, which is, it can be a totally justified feeling, but mm -hmm. your goal is to experience only positive feelings. Uh, every time I'm done, I should note this too, every time I'm done releasing, yeah. Uh, I always flood myself with positivity. I'll listen to beautiful music. I'll mm -hmm. listen to something inspirational, right? So as you let go of negative, you mm -hmm. also want to enhance the positive. So, so when you're uh, letting go, wait, wait, but when you're letting go of the negative, just so I'm really clear on this, you're not positive, are you? Like, can you be yelling or yelling? You shouldn't be doing that. Like during, when you're releasing, I, I'm just curious. Yeah, it's not, pri <laughs> so like there was this idea to release repressed emotion called primal scream therapy, right? Mm -hmm. Like that. Mm -hmm idea it just doesn't work because again it lets a little out and you feel better you mm -hmm. do mm -hmm. like it feels good to when somebody cuts you off go ah, you know mm -hmm. ah, yeah, 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 yeah. right it feels mm -hmm. good but uh all of that emotion that's underneath all of that anger that's within you you haven't dealt with yet so mm -hmm. this method is going into those layers of emotion the the anger you know you go back to when you lost your temper because you know somebody just said a snide remark right mm -hmm. the whole goal is to be more peaceful Mm -hmm. And then if you consciously choose to use your anger, mm -hmm. you say, okay, I'm going to choose to be anger, angry because this person just isn't getting it. And great leaders, you can, you can give the appearance of anger without being angry to get people to, you know, like with kids, right? Mm -hmm. um, parents do this all the time. Like you yell at your kid, you're not actually angry with them, but they need to learn the lesson and changing your tone of voice is a parenting skill. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of like that with certain people. Some people don't get things unless you say it more forcefully, right? So, uh, but it's a conscious choice. It becomes more conscious rather than automatic as you release. So that, that's, that's how I would answer that. But it's always good to go into any, we have to agree that 
generally speaking, anger is, there's better ways than being angry. It can be very useful, but there are probably better ways, right? So if we go into our anger... How, how can you be... Mm -hmm. Yes? Oh, go, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. I had a question. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, you mentioned something about, like, you know, getting your life savings stolen from you, getting $100,000 taken from you. Somebody, you know, like, for my example, identity theft and somebody presenting themselves as myself. How can you not be angry at that? And the second part is, I come from an education world, and I've witnessed a lot of teachers, and the teachers that are the most angry is when they're mm -hmm. standing in front of the class smiling because they're so furious. Right. They have to control, you know, you can't lose your shit in front right. of, you know, 40 kids, you know, right. you lose it. but, you know, how can you navigate that? Like, I, I don't know the other lady's name that was talking, but like part of my brain is like a New Yorker's brain where you're like blunt and direct and like in your face like you know and part of me is like compassion and loving it's like I don't you know it's not okay to steal from me and take from me and do all these things and I should just be like oh let it go like a whisper in the air no like you don't get to do this to me I'm gonna speak about this I'm gonna you know but it's like Right. everybody doesn't like the reaction of what comes out of me but like they don't want to tell the truth about who has stolen money from me when they know who's done it you know what i mean it's not okay so yeah, it's yeah. like i get it it's like i get uh i get back to me like emails like well how do you why do you expect people to respond when you're angrily sending out emails i don't know because when i send fuck fluffy butterflies you just don't respond i don't ever know if you get the email you know what i mean like I there's a balance true. between like yes i want to punch you in the throat chakra and <laughs> you know but i can't murder you because i don't want to go to jail right. but i also want to hold you accountable for what you've done to me and right. destroyed my life and stole my money so money. Like, <laughs> like how do you balance all that <laughs> like, right right like a um, hot shower is not going to take control. <laughs> yeah, that that's hilarious. Um, okay, so great, great question and hilarious. Um, the point is actually, you're you're feeling the when you release, you're feeling the emotion way more than other people. That's the point. Like, remember, it's witnessing and fully feeling the emotion. You're not feeling mad enough. So it's the, the idea that you're releasing um, and you're still thinking of releasing is kind of like blocking out. But you see, like in your mind, uh, as you release, you were th you're thinking of it. OK, I'm not I'm going to let go of the anger, but I'm still pissed. <laughs> right. So you go into that pissed offness like fully. Like, what do you want to do to the person who stole that money from you and stole your identity? I mean, if you could find them, maybe you'd skin them alive. Right. Maybe you'd crucify them. Right? The difference is with releasing, you're actually doing the opposite of what most people do. You just said you're a good person. You're a spiritual person. That spirituality is a form of repression. You're actually, as soon as you feel what you really feel, you're saying, I'm a good person. I'm a spiritual person. When you're in front of the class, you're smiling, you're feeling the rage. You're saying, oh, but they're just kids. Right? Like at some level, you're having a thought or some philo philosophy you hold. To repress what you're really feeling so the common misunderstanding is um you don't feel the emotion fully now when i say when no one can take advantage of you if they don't get you out of your um tranquility what i actually mean if we if, if we zoom in on that if we get a, a higher resolution i mean you've gone through all the actual emotion you feel because of what somebody did to you and because of that you now have tranquility right um and and the other thing is like somebody stole from you that obviously created emotion in the moment. Like we talked about, there's emotion that's created in the moment, but then there's all kinds of repressed emotion there too. Emotion that uh, is coming out because of what happened to you that has nothing to do with this, you know, being humiliated in the fourth grade because, you know, you tripped on stage or something might be bundled up with the, you know, it sounds crazy, but it might be bumbled, bundled up with the fact that somebody stole this money from you, right. And stole your identity. And it's not fun because I had it done a long time ago. Thank God before the internet. It is annoying. Some guy was committing crimes. The police came and tried to arrest me. 
when I was like 17, somebody stole my ID. Um, anyways, a crazy stuff. But uh, the idea is that you're doing the opposite of what most people do. You're being honest about what you feel and you're going through all the layers and you're letting the layers loop. And, um, you know, if you, if you do the shower drill, shower drill is basically good to clear something from the day. But when you're actually releasing, you're typing and feeling, what I do is I type and I feel it's like, okay, what did I want to do? Maybe you don't even know the person. Well, actually, I don't just want to find the person who stole the identity from me. I want to find his family members, right? Like the unconscious wants to eliminate a threat and all things connected to the threat. And when I say eliminate, it means eliminate. It means obliterate. It means remove them from the earth. And that's scary because you think that's you. That's not you. That's just how the shadow operates. That's how it's kept you safe throughout evolutionary history. So it, when you're really honest with releasing, you're, you're going into the darkness, right? You're going into the depths most, most people don't go into. And that's why it's different than just, you know, I'm just going to let this go. And this is where I think I've kind of expanded on because some of the Sedona method, quite frankly, which I love and I love held, it's a, it doesn't go deep enough, I don't think. There's a, there's a viciousness within you that you feel, but you haven't explored completely. And um, that's the difference. That's why this method's unique. And it's not intellectualized. Yeah, this, I'm not saying. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, this, oh, go ahead. This makes sense to me because, like, I think the other person was saying, like, letting go and, and, and screaming or getting angry or the primal rage or release. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I took a anger release workshop you know, that I was attending and it activated my brain in such, I can't even explain what happened. It mm -hmm. activated my brain in such a deep rage that like, I completely understand murderers now. <laughs> I, right. I just, no, it's, 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 it's scary yeah, how dark and how deep it went. And so they encouraged all of this rage release, you know, and for me, because I have a, neurodivergent and a, a a mind that is like very much on the spectrum it, it, there's something about my brain that you 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 can't go go that and like i started realizing there is a a, a healthier balance to it there's mm -hmm. there's some relief when you do it but it 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 anger is like a deep emotion that is unquenchable you can keep going and going so it's like this balance of, mm. you know, like how to let go in a positive way. And I liked how you said like some things are like an action, but there's not actually a really like where you really just move past through it and mm. you completely don't go back to it, you know, and you can right. just move forward in that area because some of it is like, I, I call it like stages of letting go, just like grief, but it's mm. almost, you know, I don't want to go back to it. I don't want to use my PTSD and keep going back and reliving it. I want it to be completely gone right? forever. That's what I'm looking for. I don't yeah. want to get flashed back by trauma or triggers. Right. I want it to be completely out of my psyche, like where I can have a quick thought and I move quickly past it. I don't right. want to go back and relive it. And that's... Right. When it comes, that's why I was mentioning the emotional brain and disability thing is PTSD and ASD and stuff is a neurological thing, not just like, oh, I'm pissed off at a person. You know, right, it's right, like, it, right. it's your brain can yeah. really, it can heal itself, but it can also be triggered back to points in your life. And it can, you know, it's just a, a balance of what works, you know. I agree. I agree. I agree. Yeah. If, 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 like I always say, if it's physiological, neurochemical, anatomical, I still think the method could help on the periphery, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a different sort of thing for sure. Yeah. yeah. And yes. Oh no, go ahead. Finish it to what? You, you no, that, that's it. Go ahead. A great comment, Jillian. I, I will add something in a second. You can go do ahead. it now. I can wait. I'm going uh, so I was just going to say, um, uh, usually I get to this, uh, I had like maybe 10 more slides, but, um, there, there is this fear that these emotions are infinite, right? And, and what you realize when you release, and again, I've worked, 
I don't know if I mentioned this now, but I shouldn't say again. Uh, I've worked with people who've lost a child, right? And um, mm. essentially that, that supposedly, I don't have kids yet, but that's supposedly like the worst thing someone can experience. It's up there if, you know, not at the very top. Mm. And they quote unquote, get over it. Now I don't want to say get over it in a callous way, but um, even that pain isn't, um, it seems infinite. And that's absolutely the case. Um, work, working with people with PTSD, I completely agree. You want it gone forever. And what you learn is there's like every emotion, uh, like major emotional trauma, there's actually a limited amount of emotion there. It's a limited quantity. Now it might take a very long time to release through all of that, but there is a moment at which um, it disappears uh, completely. It seems infinite. It seems it could go on forever. In my experience, uh, working with this through some pretty traumatic things on my, of my own, uh, it's, it, you have to stick with it, and um, but it eventually runs out. And, and once you do it once, the great thing about this, once something severe happens in your life and you use this method for it, again, in my experience, it gives you so much faith in the method. I usually go into the first time this really showed that it, it would work in a, a severe circumstance. Maybe I'll, we'll talk about it next time. Um, it, uh, it, it gives you faith in the method. Right. Because like I said at the beginning, it's all just emotion and it eventually runs out. But uh, I'm also pragmatic. If you feel like you went through enough of it, stop. And that's good for you. Right. Like be pragmatic as well. Do what works for you. If you found a thought or a system that helps you bypass it, use that as well. Uh, Lisa. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, so you were saying stuff where like you, you didn't like talking about where you didn't feel that you went to the emotion enough. So let's say, let's just go back to anger for a minute and we didn't go through the anger um, enough and we need to be in that more. How are you able to delve through anger in a peaceful way? So like right now mm -hmm. you can feel the, can you get back to the memory of uh, the rage you feel at the principal? Was it the principal? It's the principal. Right. Can you still feel that rage at her or discuss? I can if you want me to go there, yes. <laughs> sure. Yeah, so what I would do, and I guess it's good practice, is try to let that rage be in the back of your mind and then have a calm conversation with someone as you feel the rage, right? Mm -hmm. Now, essentially what is happening when I say you're, okay, so this is something I've been thinking a lot about. Like when mm -hmm. I say you feel the emotion and mm -hmm. you're a witness to the emotion at the same time, mm -hmm. what's really happening there? Is it actually simultaneously? Or are you just switching back and forth really quick and it seems simultaneous? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Experientially, it feels like I'm, I'm both, like I'm having the conversation now mm -hmm. and I can think about tax season. I, have to, I haven't done my taxes yet, right? Mm -hmm. I have eight days. I can feel that anxiety right now. I'm mm -hmm. actually feeling it. You can't tell I'm feeling it, mm -hmm. right? I'm, I just, I summoned it up. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just feeling that emotion. I'm <clears throat> having a conversation with you. Mm -hmm. Let me just uh, <clears throat> mute this. I'm gonna, I, I can feel a cough coming on. But that's how, um, mm -hmm. that's how you do it. Mm. Sorry about are that. You really, a, but are you me. really being with the emotion? <clears throat> like you're not, re are you not really being with the emotion, right? Of the anxiety of the tax thing. If you're obviously communicating with us right now. I mean, I don't, I, think you're, no? I don't think you're feeling it as fully, right? Uh -huh. But you're still feeling it. And I think the orientation of saying, I'm letting this run in the background. Right. Mm -hmm. When I, uh, right now, mm -hmm. my stepmother got diagnosed with a very severe form of uh, cancer about two or three weeks ago. And right. it's not looking, it's not looking great. Um, but there's hope. So I don't want to say there's no hope. Mm -hmm. um, and I worry about my dad who's mm -hmm. like, that's his whole life and blah, blah, blah. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was, it was right before I gave my first talk. And that mm -hmm. um, no, was the second talk. And um, mm -hmm. I was uh, going out and I was just letting this run. <clears throat> Pardon me. As I gave the talk. Mm -hmm. Now, was I feeling it fully? No. Did mm -hmm. anybody know I was releasing? No. When you're really releasing, mm -hmm. nobody knows you're doing it because you're mm -hmm. not expressing it. I'm not going, oh, you know, I'm not like eh, crying. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's bad, mm -hmm. but you can feel in the background and um, release. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one of the, actually, when I talk about this, usually when you go through something severe, mm -hmm. even in your dreams, to a certain extent, you're releasing. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's weird. You're feeling it while you're asleep. You feel it throughout the day. And um, it can just kind of keep running, uh, running in the background. But just, pra just practice it. Once you get it, 
it's like a superpower, right? Mm -hmm. And you also get better at releasing. It's like you can open up more mm -hmm. uh, and, and, um, and surrender things that most people would take two years to get over. You can get over in two days because you're not scared of the emotion anymore. And typically what I talk about is this thing called image blitzing, where you let all, all the images come up. And that's why I say bundle the emotion and images. So everything's emotion. So like one thing you can do is just let this like, like flood of imagery come up, what you wanted to do to the principal. Mm -hmm. Like you just see the images, but again, it's not the images, it's the feeling with the images. Right. And you can just flood through these images and they eventually run out. Really and good question. That, so for instance, with the back below, <laughs> what you were saying about when it's in the background, but you're doing obviously, so, you know, you're releasing stuff that might be in the background while you're doing something else at the moment. Do you, do you suggest though, that you do go and deal with the background at a later time and bring it to the forefront, or are you just supposed to leave it in the background, release in the background while you're doing something else? Uh, essentially what I do is just what you said. When it's in the background, like in the mm -hmm. morning, it's foreground. Cause that's what I'm focused on. Right. I'm not around other people. I don't have a right. conversation. Right, right. Right. But then I got to go about my day. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just let it, I can either block it out and say, I'm not going to deal with it. Or I can say, just let it run in the background. Mm -hmm. Right. Just let it, like I work with people with anxiety. Right. And when they have mm -hmm. anxiety, they feel like they're going crazy. They, the world's ending, like mm -hmm. it can be very severe. And I'm like, just let that world ending feeling be there mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. go about your day. Right. Mm -hmm. Nobody will know you're anxious. Mm -hmm. You can ask for more anxiety and you just kind of go about your day when you're driving. You just feel it. You just let it be there and you witness it. Now, the, when you're going through something intense, mm -hmm. and uh, this is the, the, the hardest part of releasing, you're going through something intense. Sometimes the witness and the feeling merge and you're in the feeling only. Mm -hmm. And when you're in the feeling only, you mm -hmm. think this shit is never going away. It's never going to end. I'm mm -hmm. stuck here forever. Mm -hmm. But you see, uh, underneath that's fear. Usually like, what if this overwhelms me? What if this takes me over? Mm -hmm. notice that it's just a fear that's right there. Mm -hmm. It's just a fear there that that's everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's how I would do it. And uh, so, so I'm sorry to, uh, I would love to keep talking. I have to meet my brother at five o'clock. So I'm going to mm -hmm. have to leave. Let's do one more question with Jill and you can, everyone can always email me questions and I would, I would love to uh, love to answer. Um, let's do Jill really quick. Um, Jill Bean. Yeah. I was going to ask a, uh, just a two-part question have you ever and, and maybe lisa look into this have you ever done any emdr therapy uh i have not but i've had uh i've had friends who have done it um <laughs> at, at my my brother's girlfriend in high school named austin something uh yeah. or autumn autumn uh <laughs> she had depression very bad and mm. did EDMR and it really helped her. I, I'm, I'm a pragmatist. So like try everything. You never know where your healing lies. I think for me, this is like a core component of everything I do. And uh, something else I normally talk about is when you um, release, uh, when you release, it seems like medication works better as well. And I think that's because your hor stress hormones start to uh, kind of normalize to a certain mm. extent. Right. So I, 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 there has to be some biological mechanism that makes it work better. Right. But uh, I've noticed medication therapy works better when you release. Uh, I, again, I think it has to do with stress hormones. But yeah, my brother's girlfriend, Austin, Autumn, uh, I remember uh, she did in high school and it really helped her. So be a pragmatist, explore everything. Can you, um, yeah. Jill, I didn't I, even know what EMDR is. Can you, I'm sorry. It's <laughs> eye movement desensitization reprocessing and the way you remember the acronym is like i call it the emotional em doctor dr mm -hmm. right if you look it up mm -hmm. uh it's based out of like trauma therapy mm -hmm. and um you can find it's pretty expensive i've done it uh mm -hmm. for a while um and it healed some parts but i agree that i probably should have been on medication because it does open it up like you know, mm. childhood trauma and stuff, but mm. yeah, EMDR, e I movement, mm -hmm. desensitization, reprocessing. And, um, yeah. my thing is I used to have a thing when I was at the age of 11, where every time I think about it, it would 
throw me back into that scenario with my mother. Mm -hmm. I did this therapy Mm -hmm. and I could, I could see, it was almost like a, it used to be right in my face, colorful picture. And then after the therapy, I could see a black and white photo pushed way back. And my therapist Mm -hmm. said, it's because you'll always have the memory, but the emotion is no longer um, connected. So I, I healed that part of this very, very traumatic thing. Good for um, you. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. It, it takes awesome. a long yeah. time. And, but you do, I agree with, I probably should have been on medication therapy because it can open up. If you have a disability, you can open up that mm-hmm. uh, part of you. But the second part of my question was, have you ever done a scenario where you have something and you go through each step and you like videotape yourself so somebody else can watch you or do you have anything like that dylan no i don't that's really an interesting idea though um yeah like going through like and and just like verbalizing what you're going through and like you know it could be something very not personal but like you can go through the stages of showing people like you know that i just wondered if you love that idea love that idea yeah that's a great you know i do have, have to find it but uh, I think I recorded it. I did record it. Um, I did a uh, I did a screen share of, uh, as I was typing, mm-hmm. and what I was feeling and going through the things. So uh, I'll find that. That's a great. Uh, you know, I really should post that. Um, yes, so I have please do. Like yeah, something like that would be great. That would be and very do you helpful. Have like, do you have like a way that we can all connect? Like you know, like in a support system. <laughs> You know yeah, what I mean? You know what, you know what I should start? Um, uh, a di- do, you, do you use Discord at all? Anybody? No. Uh, yeah, I'm not think- fond of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah let, me, let me think about something where we could all meet up because uh, I, I have a lot of people, New York, uh, Paris, like they're, they're all over and it would be a great community where people can share their experiences, hopefully expand and grow it because everybody has new insights. You know, I'm always looking for things to add. To it as but well. it might also yeah. be good for, but it might also be good to have the smaller groups too. Like let's say, like us in LA. Do you know what I right. mean? We're local, we can even sure. maybe get together if we want it. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, because I'm local I hate, too. Yeah, I hate to say Discord, but in Discord you can do subgroups. It mm-hmm. might be the best option. I could do a letting go institute Discord, and then mm-hmm. have the LA chapter, New York chapter, and then everybody can also comment in the overall chapter. So if you want to say something to everybody. Maybe I'll do that. I know it's a little like kind of sloppy to use, but it probably is the best way. Mm. Um, let me think about that. And um, I really hate to run. I, I love, I, usually I can stay as long as everybody wants to stay, but uh, I do have a prior engagement. Um, my email's in there. Feel free to email. I, I hope you email me so I have all of your emails. Just say, hi, I was in the letting go thing. And then uh, I'll put you in my spreadsheet. And, and that might um, be also another way, Dylan. Like if we all, like, if everyone is in agreement to, you know, um, give our email addresses. We can also keep in touch that way too, possibly. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you, you can email me anytime uh, you have any questions. Yeah, uh, Lisa, morning. I'd love to be in contact, but I'll send it to Definitely. your email. Definitely. And then, yeah. Okay. okay. Well, well, uh, uh, and just so you know, if uh, I don't respond uh, to an email right away, I'm very notorious for responding late. It doesn't mean I'm not going to respond. <laughs> I just get, a, yeah. I get, I get tons of emails and it's mostly like school uh, related yeah. and crap. So, uh, anyways, thank you I, so, 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 so much. Of course. Thank you. Uh, this is one of the best ones I've done and I really, I really appreciate it. Thanks everyone for coming. I hope everybody emails me and, um, let's stay in touch and I'll probably schedule another, another one in May or June and we can expand on this mm. and, uh, go forward from there. But thank you again. Have fun with thank your brother. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great Bye-bye. day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You too.